Hello, everybody, and welcome to the most deliriously fun and happy edition of the Jim Cornette experience that we've ever freaking had here today on this program. We're going to have so much fun, you're going to have to wipe the smiles off our faces with a sandblaster. The Ringling Brothers Cirque de Boucher Awards are in. We'll go over the winners. There's an epidemic of kidnappings, a pandemic in professional wrestling. The Big Show has relocated to the land of Lilliput. And news on how you can get cussed out by me personally on video. All this and so much more today. And joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting line, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, the man who's ready to have so much fucking fun he won't know what to do with himself, but I'll be glad to tell him what to do with himself, your friend, Maybe even his, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. I'm ready to have fun right here today <laughs> on The Experience. You were toasty earlier when I spoke to you. You, you were stressing. You were, you were frantic. The, the running the empire that is Arcadian Vanguard Network out of the daggum last manor up there and all the meetings and the business things going on and, and the, the last minute trades of game stock. GameStop. No, I have no involvement with that stock. You you have no recollection of that. <laughs> uh you you were you were you were wired tighter than a banjo string on Saturday night, as the dream machine used to say. Uh, but now you're ready to have fun now, right? That's right. I always know it's gonna be interesting when you're the one calming me down on the phone. Where I'm the one cursing up a storm, you're like, oh no, don't just relax, relax. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Fraba? Who's Fraba? <laughs> Just take a breath. Hey, the weather has perked up. I don't know about up there in the frozen Antarctic that you live in, but it was freaky here this week. We've had the snow and the ice for so long. It was two weeks before it ever went above freezing in Louisville. And then all of a sudden, the heat wave comes in. And two or three days in a row here it was almost 70 degrees. So we had a situation where I walked outside in the driveway in a t-shirt and it was almost 70 degrees and there were giant four foot icicles still hanging off the corners of the house and there were mounds of ice everywhere. It looked, it, it didn't compute visually. It was very, very freaky. Very, very strange. Of course, we're doing nothing to wreck the climate. That's all just fictitious. I've never seen an iceberg in my yard while I was standing out in, in a t-shirt. Have you? Uh, a couple times, but you know, <laughs> not a big deal. I haven't minded the bad, the bad weather. In addition to the pandemic, I've put 13 miles on black beauty since February the 1st. And most of that has been going to get deer feed and going to the bank drive through. I think once or twice. Um, it, it's been, it's been relaxing. Have you, have you gotten above freezing up there? Yeah, it got to 50 the other day, so a lot of the snow was melted, but we still have about a foot of snow <laughs> everywhere. But at least the ice is all gone from, like, the driveway. The black ice is gone from uh, all over the place, and it's been nice. And I'm still just blown away that you feed the deer. They are something we live with up here, but there are people who put electric fences to prevent the deer from coming in. There are people who put high deer fences. Oh, fuck them. So the deer can't come in. I went back and They clipped. shit everywhere. Oh, I well, they they shit down there where they, where I put the food. They don't come up here and shit in the driveway. They don't come up here and and shit on the front porch. They shit down there where deer are supposed to shit. I'm sharing my my atmosphere. I'm sharing my uh, geography here with the native residents, and I feel bad for them because before they had plenty of room, but now they put these fucking subdivisions in around here, and they've boxed them into our area here and they don't have as much grazing area as they did before so i feel bad about that and i try to augment their natural diet with something to 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 make up to them for the the inconvenience that civilized modern man has thrown them into here if only people knew years ago what an animal lover you are you were playing with cows you love to feed the deer <laughs> you love raccoons and birds and 
Now the one raccoon invaded my my area, and then to be close with you, with. to be close with you because of this reputation you have. Well, no, I'll come out and give them shit, but they're not <laughs> supposed to come in here. The one that's why I had to call the cops on that one raccoon. Hey, can I bring something up? I will go ahead. Talking about how back in the day, no one knew that you were Doctor Doolittle over there. Well, it's not like I was keeping it a secret. We <laughs> yeah. just didn't have a podcast to talk about. It. <laughs> well, you were keeping it a secret to bring it up on TBS. Well, I'm going to beat your brains in Dusty Roads, and after that, I'm going to go feed the deer. I'm going to go feed, feed deer. my deer. <laughs> you never said that. But there are a lot of other things you said. Beautiful I... Bambi and Sweet Stag, Drop Down and Leapfrog, all the various deer I've had here on the property over the last several years. So I recently got a couple of little paperbacks for my wrestling book collection. I have probably 95% of every wrestling book ever written in my collection. And these are these two little paperback wrestling superstars and wrestling superstars two. Yes. I believe this came out in 1986. You, you know what I'm talking about? This book, Fab, the fabs are on one of the covers, right? The fabs are on this one. This is part yeah. two. Can I read you a little bit of the Jim Cornette section? Cause I was reading this and laughing. Okay. I don't remember that. I remember seeing it. I think, was it, did George Napolitano, was this one of his, uh, he supplies photos, but this is not one of his books. Photos are supplied by George Napolitano and Paul Heyman. Oh, boy. For this book. So here's the Jim Cornette section. Jim Cornette has some liabilities as a manager. <laughs> Most successful managers are ex-wrestlers. Cornette never wrestled professionally. He's too small and cowardly. He, he, <laughs> he was once a close associate of another small, cowardly manager. Jimmy, the mouth of the South heart in a field where macho toughness is prized above practically anything else. Cornette is known as mama's boy. He is a mama's boy. His mother, Evelyn Cornette, Evelyn, who is very wealthy, <laughs> has been supporting her baby boy's managing career for years. Cornette makes no secret of the fact that he's a spoiled rich kid with a funny hobby. <laughs> funny hobby. I like that. He dresses like a rich kid, and he always carries a tennis racket. Jim Cornette looks as if he's about to trot off to the court for a gentlemanly game of tennis, and not off to the ring for a sweaty, brutal wrestling match. Cornette's an arrogant, non-stop talker who would irritate the most tolerant of people. His family money is always lurking in the background, and Cornette does not hesitate to use it to further his career. The magazine Pro Wrestling Illustrated helped. Wait a minute, how does money lurk in the background? <laughs> I don't know. What is this? With this, with this funny is, hobby you have, I don't is know. Is it creeping along with dun, 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 and the money just creeped out? The, okay. The magazine Pro Wrestling Illustrated held a poll for the wrestling achievements of the year 1985, in 1985, excuse me. Much to the surprise of practically everyone, <laughs> Cornette topped the managing category, besting better-known managers such as Lou Albano, Paul Ellering, and Bobby the Brain Heenan. Cornette won the contest. Did, did Heyman write this? You know, it's a, it says here Daniel and Susan Cohn. I don't know if that's an alias for Paul I Heyman. I have never heard of these. But this was an actual paperback book. This is a book. I am holding it here. Yes, it was sold on newsstands across America. Cornette won the contest on a last-minute surge of ballots sent by Federal Express from his hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> All the ballots were signed by one Evelyn Cornell. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know what? That is the story. <laughs> from PWI. That, <laughs> that after put in the, in the year in PWI, when, when that 85 Manager of the Year award, when I won it. And that's where, I think that's where they got Evelyn, too. All the ballots were signed by one Evelyn Cornell. <laughs> Not a very convincing alias for Mother Evelyn Cornette. Well, wait a minute. If you were going to use a fucking <laughs> alias, why wouldn't you use different aliases? Why would you send a, a 175,000 ballots all signed with the same name? So you're admitting it did happen. <laughs> Apparently. Since, since there were no rules about the number of times a single individual could vote. Oh, okay. All the last minute votes no uh, ballots counted. No disqualification. <laughs> Lazy booking. The Federal Express cost alone would have been several thousand dollars. That doesn't even count how much Cornette money was spent bribing someone in the magazine's office to reveal how many votes were needed to win. Wrestling columnist Stu Sachs commented sourly, in this case, Evelyn Cornette bought this election for her son with a last-minute barrage of ballots. 
But despite all this, Cornette is turning out to be more than a publicity grabber or a fellow who is willing to bop his man's opponent with his ever-present tennis racket. Boppy, I'm the bopper, the big bopper. Although he has certainly done that enough. Jim Cornette is actually a good judge of talent and sometimes a brilliant strategist. The most recent example of Cornette's skills is the tag team of lover boy Dennis Condry and beautiful Bobby Eaton, known collectively as the Midnight Express. Both Condry and Eaton have been around for some time, but never had accomplished much until Cornette took over direction of their careers and built them not only into contenders, but champions. Unlike other managers who simply buy the contracts of already successful wrestlers, Cornette has been able to create improved wrestlers. That's what a good manager is supposed to do. Maybe Jim Cornette really did deserve that award his mother bought for him. Oh, switch here. Wait a minute. Reversal now. Now I'm getting over with this unknown writer. Don't be fooled by that spoiled rich kid act. There is a very clever man behind the tennis racket. And that's from Wrestling Superstars 2 by Daniel and Susan Cohn. Well, thank you, Daniel and Susan Cohn, if you're out there for tearing me down for the first 15 minutes and then, and then kissing me at the end there. Evelyn Cornett. <laughs> that's sad, but you know what? That's the thing is everybody in the mid-80s, everybody hopped, all the publishers hopped on the wrestling boom. And books like that that sound like they were written by a, you know, it was a sixth grade essay contest or whatever. And stuff like that, just anything got greenlit, put a bunch of wrestling pictures together and somebody that can write like that. And you had a, a book and these were things were being sold as we, that's why, as, as you know, there's a ton of 80s stuff out there, but holy mackerel. Yeah. Evelyn. So Evelyn. you don't have a copy of this book on your shelf. I mean, you're in it. I do, I'm sure I, I think it's somewhere in the vault, <laughs> but yeah. I haven't seen it in years. <laughs> that's i mean that's the thing i've you know there's stuff in this house well let the you know people think on my time off that i've just been lazing around eating bonbons right but i have not i've been judicious with the use of my time while we've been recording the shows but the the store at jimcornette.com has been closed um and you know some of the things i've been doing house cleaning and organizing by next week i will have top to bottom except for the vault which is a retirement project but top to bottom, cleaned and organized the entire castle here. Everything in all the drawers, a lot of stuff tossed out, straightened out. Organizing is my way of de-stressing and being able to think and come up with some great projects, worked on some things that you're going to be seeing later on. So uh, the new merchandise piece or two for later in 2021 has been instituted. I've done some personal business. I'm redoing my will. After 20 years, I have not changed it. I'm re and things have changed. I'm redoing it. And you're in it so far, but don't get lippy. Hey, um, I'm going to be doing a few things with the folks at heritage auctions, uh, possibly one related to wrestling and, and a few other things, uh, the comic book world this year. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling better, ready to get going. We've talked about the action figures. I have the big news. The people have been the people, Brian have been waiting with bated breath, and we've all wondered what that aroma was. But their breath can be, you can gargle, folks, because the cameos, the long-awaited debut of Jim Cornette on Cameo is going to take place on Sunday, March the 7th at noon Eastern time. Everybody's been wondering what's going to happen I am one. I'm wondering myself what's going to happen, but we have, um, you know, Brian Hotchkiss, Featherbottom. He came over a couple of days ago, picked up the equipment, the new iPhone, the microphone, the tripod, the lights. We got a whole goddamn apparatus here, and we've circled back with the fine folks at Cameo. And now you can't go there now, ladies and gentlemen. And now, being subjective, I don't know when you're listening to this, but if it's before. Sunday, March 7th at noon Eastern, you cannot do this, but you will be at that time able to go to cameo.com, C A M E O, for it's only five letters. Figure it out phonetically, people. Phonetically, 
cameo.com backslash Jim Cornette. And you will be able to, if you are quick enough and nimble enough, purchase one of the 50, 50 cameos that we're putting up. This is the test run. If we are able to do this successfully and it doesn't add years to my life, we will be doing it again in the future. And we will let you know uh, about that. But uh, the first time and possibly the last time, (laughs) it's 50. And they go on sale Sunday, March 7th at noon Eastern at Cameo.com. And I will cut a promo on you. I'll cut a promo on somebody else. I'll say happy anniversary, happy birthday, go fuck yourself. Anything not illegal directed at yourself or others. Even if they're not willful recipients, I don't give a shit. Uh, As long as it's not illegal, I'll say it. But Brian, we have to lay down some ground rules here, right? Because we've talked about this. No essay questions. We even sometimes we get these on the drive through where I'm doing one show for 250,000 people instead of 250,000 deals for one person. So no essay question. Don't ask me, tell me the history of professional wrestling, Jim Cornette. That won't work. You're getting 250 characters here at, at, at cameo.com to explain what you want me to say and who you want me to say it to. I would suggest plan this out ahead of time so when you get on there at noon on Sunday, March 7th, you can type it right in instead of withering over it a bit and possibly losing out. Um, But yeah, no essay questions, but give me something to work with. As we've mentioned, I can't call somebody fat if they're skinny. I need something to work with. Give me some description. Tell me a little bit about this person, and I'll take it from there. You can call them skinny fat. Well, that uh, that's really not a very good insult. It's a wrestling insult. Well, it's a, it's a, triple, there's a, lot it's of a triple H insult. insult. Yeah. There's a lot of wrestling insults out there. Most of them are working actively these days, the wrestling insults. Anyway, nevertheless, uh, that's what we're going to be doing. We'll, we'll uh, update you more uh, uh, on the next program, but that's a, it's a week from this coming Sunday, so you got a little time. And they are going up at $149 after looking at the field. I know, Brian, last you said that's That's too cheap. Way too cheap. Well, I I think it's a little bit much, but Cameo gets a cut, and Hotchkiss doesn't work for free, and he's the key man in all of this. So we've got to be, but uh, we'll see what happens. Anyway. you got to jack that up. That's way too low. Well, I'm not going to do that, because I want want to make it for the people. I don't want to make it just for the... Hotsy yeah, totsy okay. hoy polloi up there for, you know, you polo pony oh, right yeah. motherfuckers. Let's see how you feel after the first 50. <laughs> then I have a feeling you're going to well, be like, you know what? Fuck the people. Let's check this fuck shit Fuck the out. people. <laughs> Boy, no wonder you're so unpopular. <laughs> fuck this. Fuck the people. And fuck Christmas while we're at it. You, you and melanoma. Uh, and of course, that will be the week before. March 7th, in case you haven't figured that out, is the week before. Uh, the Cornette's Collectible Store reopens at jimcornette.com on Sunday, March 14th with the restock of the original and Christmas variant action figures, of uh, Jim Cornette action figures from the Figures Toy Company. And we've said before, this is going to be the last run of both of these. We're going in different styles and different directions in 22 and beyond, or 2022 and beyond. So for this year, these are the last runs of these, the only place you can get them autographed. And I've got up to 1,500 of each available. Will they last till Christmas? I don't know, because the last 400 lasted about two hours. Uh, but that will be Sunday, March 14th. The store and all its various wonders will be reopened. And I, then I'll be a fucking nervous wreck again for another year and a half. But it's it's been, it's been nice being able to slow down and and decompress a bit. and and also. For those of you asking, and thank you, Stacy's appointment with her new back doctor that's taken the place of her old back doctor that left the practice under cover of darkness between Christmas and New Year's is next week, because that's the first time that she could get in to see anybody else, and then they're probably going to tell her again that she needs to have her back operated on like they did fucking three months ago. And then, uh, so I'll be updating you folks on that but uh we're still stuck where we were last time 
What about you? How's your back? My back's all right. Well, fuck your back. All right. <laughs> what did I do? I, I'll figure something out. I've got an email here. Okay. Um, we've talked about the, the mess they had with the weather in Texas because they got their own power grid down there and the, and it's deregulated. They're, they're the, there's no federal regulation of the electric utility in Texas. It's all up to the state on purpose. They did this on purpose so that they the energy companies down there that own the state could make more money. And we also mentioned that since there is no federal regulation of Texas's electric grid, they didn't winterize it because they didn't think they had to. Because how often does shit like that happen? And then a bunch of that shit happened all at the same time. And four million people without power and all, then all the fucking pipes broke. And then everybody was sleeping in the streets and picking up garbage. And, it's, and Ted Cruz flew to Cancun and got caught and came back. Um, and all that good stuff. Well, we have an update from someone from a Texan. That is actually the subject from a Texan. Will in Dallas. Dear Jim, I just wanted to say thank you sincerely for bringing attention to your Twitter followers and the cult of Cornette, the plight of the Texans due to the Republican leaders failures in maintaining the electrical grid for winter temperatures. It turns out that denying climate change and wanting to deregulate everything can be a bad thing. Being in Dallas, my residents had lost power for more than 48 hours in literal sub-zero temperatures. It boiled my blood to learn that our governor put the blame on the agency in control of the power grid that he himself has authority of, and our Senator Cruz decided it was the perfect time to go on vacation around the time I was using bottles of water to wash myself due to not having power or running water. A side of, or running water, a side effect of the power loss has now been burst pipes and plumbers are booked until March here. We're not all Trump fucks. We consider you as much of a Texan as anyone for standing up for us and our incompetent leaders. <clears throat> Did you hear about the guy that got the $17,000 electric bill? I saw a few stories like that where people got big electric bills. Well, I mean, he couldn't be the only one, but he was the one on the news that I saw. But there were multiple giant bit Apparently... What they conned these people into doing was signing up for, and Brian, as soon as you hear this phrase, you're going to want to hop on this, being the business savvy tech genius that you are, wholesale electricity. <laughs> I didn't know about that, no. Yes, there's a deal where basically you would sign up with, they've got hundreds of independent, privately owned power companies of some kind that sell the power that they make, the chaste cat that ate the rat that lived in the house that Texas built, right? They sell wholesale electricity. It's like you pay 10 bucks to join the thing, and then you get your electric power at wholesale. But in the fine print, wholesale normally is normal. But during periods of high demand or whatever the fuck, they can raise the price. And they got these people to sign up not to get a bill in the mail, but to have auto deduction from their bank accounts of their electric bill. And the guy got billed $17,000 for five days of electricity in the middle of this crisis. And, and as you say, he wasn't the only one. And, and it, 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 so people are and they took the money. They took the money out of their fucking bank accounts. And now they got to complain about it, right? We ought to call Stephen P. News, see how long it'll take them to get their money back, if ever. <sighs> Deregulation. I won't even make this a political show today, but I just wanted to bring that. Here's another one. Like to hear it? Here it goes. Ryan writes, in the early to mid-80s, right after cartoons went off the air, literally the air, we didn't have cable in those days, NWA Wrestling came on on our little 13-inch tube TV. So cartoons went into more cartoons. No, me and my younger brother were young kids stranded in the hillbilly town of Belmont, North Carolina. I guess the TV stuff we got to see was mid-Atlantic. Long story short, it inspired me and my little brother to build a wrestling ring in our backyard out of twine for the ropes and tomato steaks drilled into the earth in order to make the squared circle with a few bales of hay to soften any impact. See, they were smarter back then because now they don't even use the hay. They just bump on the fucking asphalt it was hilariously bad ryan goes on to say and collapsed in the middle of our first match 
NWW stood for Neighborhood Wide Wrestling. I even designed a logo and everything. Unfortunately, the local kids saw it as a fight club rather than working on their gymnastic skills, and the whole operation was shut down by a combination of parental intervention and fear of lawsuits. Luckily, no one was too seriously injured, although my brother got epilepsy from it, but that's a whole nother story. And he doesn't tell it. That <laughs> that that's was one of the problems. Email. That was one of the problems with having like a little neighborhood or like whenever your friends would come over, you guys, hey, let's, you know, wrestle. And some of you would try to work. And then every time, every time something would happen where a match would turn into a shoot yeah, on the front the, lawn. Some guy or guys <laughs> didn't get the working idea yeah. and, and didn't know what they were doing. Sort of, And those guys grew up to now be signed to AEW Wrestling. <laughs> But I just, you know, that's, that's the thing that, that before we get into the, uh, as I mentioned before, the Ringling Brothers Clown College and Cirque du Boucher Awards have been presented. Uh, but you're old enough. I definitely am old enough. When wrestling fans of our generation, most of us, when we had matches, when we wrestled, whether it was if you could get in the high school locker room gym and use the real pads, or whether you did it in the living room, or whether it was out in the backyard, whatever, you were working. And or you were you were working hand-to-hand within some parameters instead of, and there, there in the early days of video cameras, I'm sure guys shot their matches, but there was no place to put it on the internet so nobody was taking blunt instruments and really bashing each other nobody was running over each other with cars nobody was jumping off things through tables with tacks or barbed wire or that had been set on fire or there was none of that because we didn't want to fucking kill ourselves right that was the we would if if the wrestlers had been doing that, at least speaking from my experience, I doubt very seriously if me or any of the other people that I engaged in matches with would have done any of that shit either. Unless we could have found fucking plastic thumbtacks. And, 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 because the idea was not to really get hurt, right? You ever see those videos of guys? I feel like it's Walmart, but it could be any store. Like in the aisles of various stores, they start working matches with high spots. Yes, I've seen it. Yes, I've seen it on Twitter or whatever. And they're no different than the guys you see on AEW. So you can't say, like, oh, they're hurting each other. No, they look like they're actually trying to protect each other while doing overly choreographed spots. It just happens to be in aisle three at Walmart. And how they get away with that without the cops being called, I have no idea, but that's another story. <laughs> but that. I, I don't. Uh, you know. It, Maybe we were, even though we weren't smart to the business necessarily, at the at least I wasn't at the time I was doing that. We were, you know, monkey see, monkey do, simulating what we could figure out from television, but we didn't have any training or didn't know how to, or from live events, not, not just television, but we didn't know how to do these things or how they actually did them. But we sure weren't going to do something that we obviously knew. A, we're, we don't really know how they're doing this shit, and I will hurt myself if I try this. That it, And I just can't understand where we went sideways, unless it's the fact that the wrestlers got really so much stupider and caused weak-minded people to emulate that, but now we have a bunch of people. We're going to have a bunch of people, I guarantee you, you're going to see this on the news. Fucking ended up in the hospital because they got drugged behind a pickup truck in a fucking bag. Only they're not going to use a gimmicked stuntman body bag. They're going to use a fucking hefty bag out of their mother's fucking pantry. And they're going to leave shreds of their skin over a quarter mile radius. And it <clears throat> body bags and kidnapping. Anyway, let's speak. Well, let's go ahead. Who, who got the the award for best kidnapping in this year's Oscars. I mean, Dave's. If you're talking about the Observer Awards, there were no awards given out for best kidnapping this year. What, ab what about best body bag drag? Quite frankly, I think these are 2021 candidates, not 2020. Hmm. 
Well, no, it was it was in 2020 that he. What about falling off a shelf in a body bag? He fell off a shelf in a bag once. Well, you can't just name the award for something that happened one time. It has to be a part of a collection of well, things. That's why, that's, why, that's why I said best kidnapping. We've had three of those on one show. Well, we did have several kidnappings last year, although they really have ramped it up the last few weeks. <laughs> There's been just a whole bunch. It's part kidnappings. of the overall wave toward domestic terrorism. Now kidnappings are on the rise. Only in wrestling. So apparently Uncle Dave has given out his annual awards and wouldn't you know who won the pony? Some of the categories were not hard to figure out. Well, again, he doesn't give them out. They're voted on by the readers of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Well, yes. And and I think there we have come to figure out which came first, the chicken or the egg. Did Uncle Dave lose his mind and or principles for real or just for profit. And I think we now have discovered it's for profit because the only people who still give a shit enough about wrestling, apparently to subscribe to the observer are the people who think that whatever they're doing on Wednesday nights over there on TNT is what wrestling is supposed to look like. So that's why he's the, the PR agent because you remember, you may not be old enough to remember the 80s, but in the 80s, the, the Observer readership was the few smart fans in the United States. And we've talked about it, five to 10,000 tops in the 80s. I don't even think it was that high. Don't even, it, 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 no. it wouldn't have been that high. I think it was a few thousand, let's say at the most 4,000. And then once Dave did the national is when things really went into okay but I'm, and I'm not trying to belittle his subscribership i'm saying from from that from those lowly beginnings but at that time there were not that many smart fans in the united states the ones that were were the most dedicated fans of wrestling and so therefore the observer readers mirrored or the observer awards that the readers voted on mirrored the readers taste and they were more because they were smart. They were into the business. They were more devoted to it. They were into the workers and into the talkers, not the, they, they were, they, they were the tape the, traders. I mean, well, the they observer the started traders. as a tape trading yeah. newsletter because Dave was trading tapes and it was his way of communicating with the other people he traded tapes with. And, and that was the, the, the guys who saw all the, and very few girls who saw all the, wrestling around the world and were into, as I said, the workers and the, the real talents. And so they were the flair people, not the Hogan people. They were the NWA people, not the WWF people because the WWF was hokey cartoon showbiz wrestling. And so they leaned in that direction, but they were still smart enough to recognize, okay, yes, Hulk Hogan's going to win best, best box office draw, blah, blah, blah. In the nineties, the both WCW and the WWF got, so shitty that the readership went more toward ECW Smoky Mountain Japan for the first most of the 90s because the two companies were bleh and it was still a smaller but growing readership that still wanted the the essence of wrestling and then the attitude era brought everybody back for a, a bit to the big companies because everybody was over and business was on fire because of all the hot shotting. But then that kind of blew it out. And then WWE went PG, which was by that point anathema to the, the observer readership. But at the same time, there was nothing really going on over here otherwise. And, and it became, well, it's Japan and the Indies and the work rate. And slowly, it is now turned into the observer readership after 40 years that started because they were the the smartest and the most dedicated wrestling fans and didn't like the fucking hokey bullshit has become an entire readership that likes the hokey bullshit. They and and so Dave has gone with that rather than have the same opinion he had 30 years ago because he's the same human being and fucking people don't change their fucking spots. It, 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 he could see what was going on then. He can still see it now. 
but he chooses not to because that's his readership. Because who else is going to... I don't want to be a spoiler. We're going to go over the results in a second. But Tony Khan was voted as best booker. Nobody who has ever booked, nobody who has ever worked with a booker, and being honest, and nobody who has ever seen professional wrestling presented in any type of fucking legitimate proper fashion would vote for Tony Khan as a booker, much less the best booker, because it's rotten, and nobody will tell him because he's the boss. But in a secret ballot, no. So what you've got is you've got an audience of people that are primarily now reading Dave's newsletter that have never seen wrestling the way the, uh, the wrestling that he was writing about 25 and 30 years ago and thinks this is the way it's supposed to be. And it is it. it and, and uh, most of the people from my generation, most of them from your generation have just thrown up their hands and said, fuck it. We can't watch this shit anymore. So why read about it? Do you, is that what it is? Well, we'll talk more about the Tony Khan best booker thing in a moment, but I think the Observer readership has changed. Naturally. You know, I mean, it's a different time period. You get new people coming in. You get older people saying, I'm not really interested anymore. Maybe they only want the historical stuff. I heard from a lot of people years ago that got turned off by all the MMA stuff. You know, I mean, there's different reasons people come and go. He did go heavily into MMA, which was drier than in a lot of cases, than reading about wrestling. Right. But there was a, at a period of time where there wasn't much wrestling. That's true. It seems like there's less MMA now because it's an alternative to WWE. <laughs> but um, I, I think there is an audience that whatever Dave champions they go with. And I'll give you an example. I actually recently spoke about this with someone who knows Dave really well. And... We were talking about the Hall of Fame, not to relitigate this, and Kenny Omega going in. And we both had the same thought, which was Kenny Omega wouldn't have gone in if Dave hadn't been the one to say he's the best wrestler in the world, he's having the best matches, seven stars. If none of that had happened and he just said, five star match, really good at the Tokyo Dome, he probably wouldn't have gone into the Hall of Fame. But Dave pushed him to another level compared to everything before him. And I think with the awards, you know, Dave will push back and say that, you know, if you say that he doesn't criticize AEW, you don't read the newsletter. I read the newsletter. I've read every one of them. And I think the pushback on AEW when they do bad stuff is nowhere near what it has been in the past or even recently when it comes to WWE doing bad stuff or anyone or Impact or TNA in the past. The pushback on AEW is very, very different. Now, this goes into the Tony Khan being best booker. It wasn't a year where there were a lot of bookers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know there, was, there were less wrestling shows and there weren't a lot of bookers and the ones who were there weren't doing anything special. So in that way, in a sense, yeah, I can kind of see it. You know, I mean, no disrespect to Sherry Martell. Sherry Martell won manager of the year, the year you weren't managing. There wasn't a lot of competition. Heenan was retired primarily by that point. Heyman didn't really do much in 1991. You know what I mean? Like there was a year where there wasn't the cream of the crop at the top of the managerial pole, not to take anything away but, from Sherry because she was great. <laughs> so I think you have that. But also the other thing is this. But, like, but you have, let me just uh, pause, yeah, pause please. and come back to it. So because there's a dearth of legitimate candidates, you vote for the one person who has exhibited less aptitude and skill and knowledge for that particular job than anyone on a national basis ever, including shit stain. Cause at least he always had an editor. You reward that. Well, again, Just because there's a few other people out there is not really doing much. Well, again, Tony Khan has a very chummy relationship with the world of the observer <laughs> and I'm not a fan of Tony Khan's booking because it's bad. Whatever anyone wants to say about how much you like the matches, or even some of the people that are into the cult of personality and say, like, oh, I love the Young Bucks, anything they do. The actual booking of the television show, segment to segment, episode to episode, 
is not good. It's add in really the bad. add in the live the live lineups for the pay per views and etc. As part of the just the matchmaking, not only the format. There's differences in booking. There's formatting a television show. There's matchmaking. There's a compiling a talent roster, and we're talking spectacular failure at all those levels to have a coherent product. There's the word. It's not a coherent show week to week. It's a badly done wrestling show with matches that a lot of people really like and personalities that a lot of people really like, but the actual booking is bad. But let me ask you this, Jim, having said that, and that's the way I feel, Tony Khan, not a good booker in any sense of the word, but he has had some financial success. The pay-per-views have done well. They got the contract early on with TNT, although it's a relatively cheap contract for TNT. It's cheap television. It's cheap programming. It makes sense for TNT. It's money that makes AEW profitable. So with that said, that AEW is profitable, that AEW more than likely isn't going anywhere and has had profitable pay-per-view events. Yes. Is that enough? to say, even though the television show is incoherent, even though it's as hokey as the bad WWE stuff that the same audience would criticize, even though you could say things don't make sense, angles are dropped, things aren't followed up on, it's booked seemingly by someone who's snorting Ritalin. Does the success mean that you can vote for him for best booker, just based on that? No. It means you can vote for him for promoter of the year. And that he should win, but not Booker. If McDonald's sells more cheeseburgers than anybody else in the world, does that mean that McDonald's cheeseburgers still don't suck compared to most cheeseburgers in the rest of the world? Or does that mean that they are great business and they sell a substandard product because of their name and marketing? So if you want to go Tony Khan promoter of the year for all the reasons you just mentioned, I'll go for that. But Booker of the Year? Holy fuck no. It's an insult that one would put the title Booker after someone who has written this television program for the last year. I agree with That's you. That's an insult to Bookers. I agree with you. And I think he does a really, really bad job of putting a TV show together. And they haven't been able to grow their audience. They're at the core audience that they've always been at. So he's making money off a substandard product that's not getting any more popular. So he's the promoter of the year. So they're making, that's right. They're making money. But, you know, again, it's an audience that tends to be the observer audience nowadays. Well, get, what are but the with, rest of these awards? Well, but what I was going to say is, but with that said, and again, I think he's a horrible booker. Who else is even a viable candidate for 2020 as a booker? Well... Nobody will take individual credit in the WWE because nobody actually is the individual booker. They have writers, so you can't, and Vince is the final say-so, but you can't really call Vince the booker. But I would have gone for making the best of a bad situation uh, with Delirious and Ring of Honor because he managed to come back and even though Maryland has a stringent athletic commission, they put that pure tournament together. They did their television. They didn't, from what that I saw, do any insulting bullshit. Um, and it it was a nice product. I don't know what they're doing in Japan because I don't follow it. But the Japanese always do well. But they, but they had a pandemic too. Why? That's right. That's right. So what about just none of the above for the winner this year? And I think Delirious, who again inherited a bad situation because Marty Skrull got let go after everything that happened with him with speaking out. I think Delirious gets overlooked because Ring of Honor doesn't get paid too much attention to anymore because of AEW. And because well, and so also much Delirious, there. Delirious by design because he works his gimmick uh, and, he, and he doesn't do interviews and he doesn't want attention and he doesn't want to be fucking built around. And as soon as he got the book, he took himself off cards except for a, special match once in a while that he usually loses so he's completely the antithesis of a stereotype booker he doesn't want any attention which is refreshing um and he probably wouldn't have wanted to win this because then that would have been attention 
Uh, but you know what you do bring up? What do you get? Impact? They, whoever writes that fucking fiasco, yeah. they had a fucking wedding where a guy got shot. And then they, they allowed some outlaw goof to work with himself on one of their pay-per-views on a green screen. So that's none of the above. Maybe you're right. But shouldn't there be some type of asterisk next to Tony Khan's name when 30 years ago, 30 years ago, 30 years from now, people are looking up the prestigious Booker of the Year award. It should be asterisk. He won this because he was the only dog in the race. I don't know. I mean, taking Tony Khan out of the equation, should you look at the entirety of 2020 that way? We didn't get much good. Going beyond AEW, WWE was awful. NXT completely fell off. Yeah. Raw and SmackDown, when we tried to watch it, was unwatchable. The pay-per-views with the Thunderdome and the fake noise, and we could talk about that with the AEW show this week in a little while, but also with the cinematic matches. An awful year all around for WWE. There isn't much out there. Ring of Honor, the pure title tournament, was really well done. And it didn't get that much attention at all. I think that it's a weird year. 2020, and we'll see how 2021 works out. But 2020 was such a weird year because there was so much not going on in wrestling, let alone society as a whole. I I will be interested in seeing when people get back in the arenas, whether there's... At first, it'll be like what we used to call a virgin territory. I remember the guys that... uh, uh, we're working Georgia when they opened up Ohio after what Sheik quit running in what, for the most part, widespread 80, in Ohio, of uh, 79, 80. And then a couple years later, you know, Georgia off, off TBS, they open up Columbus because that was one of the first heavy cable cities and Dayton. And then they went to the towns of Michigan. And the guys that were on the card said it was virgin territory. You went out first match, they locked up and grabbed a headlock. The people popped because they hadn't seen anything in so long. So the crowds are going to be easy, one would think, when when they're finally allowed to be back at whatever capacity and, you know, pretty much close to normal. And then the question is going to be, are these guys smart enough to do less because the people re- are reacting more? and not run off and leave them because that's the second lesson I learned. The first one was virgin territory. They'll pop on shit because they haven't seen it and they're starved for it. And then the same guys said, and then we started doing the same kind of finishes we were doing in the rest of the territory that they'd seen us for the previous several years. And it was too much for the virgin Ohio territory. And they were doing run-ins on the third show and it fucking burnt that atmosphere out because they did too much and the people got used to it too quick. We'll see what happens. You want to hear some of the award winners? Yeah, sure. The Luthez slash Ric Flair Award for Wrestler of the Year. The winner, John Moxley. Oh, God damn it. With 883 first oh, place votes, meaning or equaling 4,873 points. What, wait a minute. Now, how many votes and points? I, I forgot he's got a system. Uh determined by points on a five to three to two basis. So you get five points for every first place vote you get. And Moxley got 883 first place votes. How many total votes did he get? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. No, we only know the points. So an award named after Luthez and Ric Flair goes to a balding plumber from Cincinnati that looks nothing like or works nothing like, or has no reputation anything like Luthez or Ric Flair. John Moxley, Jonathan Good, 35, became the 23rd winner of the award in a year where he spent most of the year as AEW champion and almost the entire year as the IWGP US champion. Oh, well, he's got that going for him. He filled the year with memorable programs with the likes of Kenny Omega, Chris Jericho, Minoru Suzuki, Eddie Kingston, Brody Lee, Brian Cage, and Lance Archer. He had consistently great matches, <sighs> delivered some of the year's best promos, and was a key factor in AEW's first full year as a television promotion. Give me the winners of that award from 19... 
88 to 1998? Uh, 88, Akira Maeda. 89, Ric Flair. 90, Ric Flair. 91, Jumbo Saruta. 92, Ric Flair. 93, Vader. 94, Toshiaki Kawada. 95, Mitsuharu Misawa. 96, Kenta Kobashi. 97, Mitsuharu Misawa. And 1998, Steve Austin. Uh, at least we got, came back to America. Remember what I said about I said in the 90s? They went to ECW Smoky Mountain in Japan. Well, you can't criticize any of those guys from all Japan. They were the no, best it, of their era. They were fantastic. No, but the, 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 the point is, um, and John Moxley fits in with that. What about the following 10 years after that? Who else? 98 to 2008. 99, Mitsuharu Misawa. 2000, Triple H, 2001, Kiji Muto, 2002, Kurt Angle, 2003, Kenta Kabashi, 2004, Kenta Kabashi, 2005, Kenta Kabashi, 2006, Mystico, 2007, John oh. Cena, and 2008, Chris Jericho. Wait a minute, that Mystico didn't work out for him, did he? Well, he was, you know, people now overlook it because of the failure of Sin Cara, but he was... A major star in Mexico. He still oh, is, he was, but not to that extent. He was huge. He was major huge. drawing he just, card. Yeah. He just couldn't fucking work anywhere else. That's why they got rid of him. But anyway, um, and then John Moxley. All right, let's go to another award. Okay, which other award are you interested in hearing? I just what are they? I don't have it in front of me. You uh, got? It. I'm sure you're not interested in the mixed martial arts most valuable, most just outstanding wrestler, points. most okay. outstanding wrestler. Okay. The winner, Kenny Omega. Oh, good God. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Ah. Okay, who was the most outstanding wrestler for, for, for the, the year of the, the 90, or the decade of the 90s? Uh, let me go to the award started in 1986. 1990, Jushin Liger. 1991 and 1992, Jushin Liger. 93 and 94, Kenta Kabashi. 95, Manami Toyota. Oh, good Lord. 96, Ms. <laughs> Rey Mysterio Jr. 97, Mitsuhara Misawa. 98, Koji Kanemoto. And 99, Mitsuhara Misawa. I have never sat down and realized how badly he's Japan-centric until now. Well, again, these Dave doesn't anoint anyone these awards. They're voted on by the people who read Dave. Yeah, but, well, as you said, he was leading, he's leading them now, he was leading them then. The most outstanding wrestler in the world was never in the United States of America, except for Rey Mysterio, for 10 years. Tag Team of the Year? The Young Bucks! <laughs> With 653 first place votes, and this is their record setting, seventh time in eight years <sighs> winning Tag Team of the Year. No other team has ever won it more than three times, and that team, the Midnight Express, had two different partners of Bobby Eaton in their 1986 to 1988 run on top. So, in a world that FTR exists, in a world where Mark and Jay Briscoe exist, these guys are supposed to be the best tag team in the world. Re read the 80s tag team list. This is where it will be shown up. 1980, the Freebirds of Terry Gordy and Buddy Roberts. 1981, Terry Gordy and Jimmy Snuka, an underrated tag team if I say yes. so. 82, Stan Hansen and Ole Anderson. 83, Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood. 84, the Road Warriors. 85, the British Bulldogs. 86, the Midnight Express of Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton. 87 and 88, the Midnight Express of Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane. 89, the Rockers. 1990, the Steiner Brothers. There you go. And the Young Bucks win the same award. They ought to have a, a smaller version of like a, a smaller cup or trophy or whatever, just in case, so it'll be small enough that the Bucks can carry it. Uh, what's the next? Next award. Best on interviews. All right. Now, this is an award that you've won, I believe, a few times, haven't you? Yes, you have. I'm looking here. You won in 85, 86, 87, 88, 
1993, so a multiple-time winner. This year's winner, Eddie Kingston, with 474 first-place votes. I can't actually argue with that. And once again, the field is not as strong, but Kingston has a lot of fucking oomph in his promos. If if they'd have settled on a clear path for him to take when he started in that fucking company, he'd be a lot more over than he is now. But he's, since he's been a baby face and a heel and sympathetic and a prick and up and down and all around, you know, but, but good promos. Good promos. Promotion of the year. All Elite Wrestling, 1,097 first place votes and 5,717 points. Uh, okay. And here's what Dave wrote. It was a one-sided race. <laughs> so, <laughs> circumstances didn't lead this to be a banner year for anyone. New Japan was hurt badly, more than any other company. Some would say they were the most responsible during the time period but they suffered as a product worse than almost anyone between border restrictions and shutting down and shortening shows. They could not have the classic G1s like previous years, but they did start the year with a promotional high point of selling more than 70,000 tickets in two days and had the best four-week period with G1. Well, sounds like they ought to won. Yeah, it sounds like Dave's saying they should have won, doesn't it? <laughs> Anything else of note? Uh, best weekly TV show, AEW Dynamite. God oh, damn it. Jesus Christ. With 1,151 first place votes and 5,994 points. Well, wait a Hold on. Wait a minute. If you get five points for every first place vote, then didn't they just basically, they just, everybody voted for them in first place. And that, that means that they got 1100 votes or whatever. Well, I mean, if you look at this list, number two is NXT with 20 first place votes. <laughs> number three. And boy, this is, this is where Dave championing something puts it over the top. Being the elite, 24 first place votes. What? The third best weekly TV show is the Young Bucks. Awful. YouTube comedy show. Stupid comedy show on YouTube. Is... My God. That's amazing. All right. Best pro wrestling match of the year. The Young Bucks versus Kenny Omega oh, and Adam yes. Page <laughs> in Chicago. 733 first place votes. 4,285 points. Uh, now, that was a really good match. It was no, a really good the, match. The, the year that uh, we saw Walter and Elia. That was fifth place. <laughs> okay. MMA fight of the year you don't care about? Let's see. Uh, the U.S. and Canada MVP. Is this a new award? Uh, it's been the last couple of years. John Moxley <laughs> won the what? award. Wait, what? Now the U.S. and Canada gets their own MVP, so another one of his boys can win an award? Can I ask you something? And, and personal feelings about Dave out of the picture for this yes yes used to be best baby face best heel at some point i think in the attitude era those awards went away and it just became best box office draw which again is not really something you should vote on who's the best box office draw let me think about it no it's that's like it, specifically it, based on that's analytics and a stats. statistical fucking yeah. thing yes why wouldn't you have best baby face and best heel if you want to argue that in the 90s everyone became a tweener and steve austin was a heel who was a baby face I may not agree with you, but I can understand the argument. What's the point in not having it now? It's not like it should just go away forever. There are heels and baby faces. Well, not really, because nobody knows how to be either one. So you really can't tell. And, and since you have amateur bookers winning awards who are putting heels against heels and baby face against baby faces, just like willy nilly, like that, that's something you would just do. Um, who knows who is who knows who's what? The Japanese MVP, Tetsuya Naito, and the Mexico MVP, Ray Phoenix. Well, at least it wasn't Maki Ito over in Japan. We can't forget about the Europe MVP, Walter. The... Oh, well, thanks. Walter gets something. The Hodge Award. <laughs> I didn't know about this one either. The Hodge Award for non-heavyweight MVP. Hiromu Takahashi. Well, now they're just making shit up. Non-heavy... I, I, you know, I've been reading The Observer 
since 93 and then I got every back issue. But I never really pay too much attention to the year-end awards. Like, I don't vote for the year-end awards. I know who, like, wins some of the big awards, but I don't vote. I didn't even know there was a non-heavyweight I've MVP. I've never heard of that before, and I've been reading him longer than you have. Women's wrestling MVP, Bailey. Uh, MMA MVP, best box office draw. Again, this is a, how do you vote on this? Conor McGregor. Number two, John Moxley. <laughs> Number what? three, Wait, Chris what? Jericho. Conor McGregor and John Moxley. <laughs> neck and neck. Oh. What the fuck? Conor McGregor made $100 million in one night. John Moxley got a fucking bottle of Jack Daniels and a fucking hot dog. Yeah, here it is. Best baby face and best heel ended in 1996. That was the last year that anyone won those awards. Well, and that was the last then, year that anybody was the best at it, I guess. And that, since then, it's been best box office draw, which Conor McGregor has won many, many times. Feud of the year. Now, we've watched a lot of wrestling, Jim. Any guesses on feud of the year for 2020? I'm trying to think of who had something that I would consider a legitimate feud that was believable and that you thought that they were really fucking mad and pissed off at each other. I'm coming up blank. It is rough to think of a really good feud for the year. Even some of the ones that people love in AEW, again, like Young Bucks and FTR, horrible booking. From beginning to end, just They didn't have a feud. They just had a couple of matches so that the Young Bucks could beat them and make them look bad, and then they sent them off to work with the fucking midget. And that's the sad part. That was the feud. Really bad booking. Feud of the year, John Moxley versus Eddie Kingston. I don't know if I would have picked that. Is that a feud now? They were mad for three weeks and had a match or or two? Did they have two? I think they're still mad. I don't think there's been any end of the simmering madness (laughs) from either of those men. (laughs) For the record, though. But it ain't a fucking feud if they're not headlining the goddamn pay-per-view with it. for For the record, though, and this is where the awards have really gone completely crazy with AEW. I'm going to name some of the previous Feud of the Year winners. Tell me if these are all-time classic feuds that, you know, you think of and you're like, yeah, that's a great one. You ready? Okay. 1980, Bruno San Martino versus Larry Zabisco. Yeah, you think. 81, Andre the Giant versus Killer Khan. Uh Uh-huh. 82, Ted DiBiase versus Junkyard Dog. Of course. 83 and 84, Freebirds versus Von Erichs. Huge. 85, DiBiase versus Duggan. Yeah. 86, Hogan versus Orndorff. Yep. 87, Lawler versus Austin Idol and Tommy Rich. Yep. 88, Midnight Express versus Fantastics. Yep. 89, Ric Flair versus Terry Funk. Yep. 2020, John Moxley versus Eddie Kingston. <sighs> right? I mean, no, no disrespect to those guys. But it doesn't belong there. There wasn't <laughs> another belong. there wasn't another feud listed, uh, another program of on that list where those guys didn't wrestle literally it, well in andre and killer khan's case dozens of times and in the von erics and freebirds case every night for two years hundreds of times and andre and killer khan's uh well it may not have all been the same year but they actually worked multiple territories too with that feud yeah because they sent the video around Exactly. But the point is you remember it. It went it went on the the promos and the build went on for weeks and weeks. The matches went on and then the returns and the returns and the stipulations. And yes, those were programs, those were feuds, those were rivalries. This is a couple matches on TV and some promos. What the fuck? Is this what what's left? The answer is yes. Yeah. But Jim, most improved wrestler of the year, Dr. Britt Baker. I wish I could tell, but I've invoked the tooth and nail rule. So if she's gotten better, I'm happy for her, but I ain't going to be watching. Most charismatic, MJF. I can't argue Guess who's number two? Guess who's number two on the list of most charismatic? Who? Orange Cassidy. Oh, for God. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Cody's only seven. (laughs) <laughs> Cody's number seven. <laughs> Fuck on that list. He, he, Jesus Christ. He must have the personality of the fucking way a dog's breath smells after it eats its own puke. 
Best Technical Wrestler, the Brian Danielson Award. Because remember, he was retired for a few years, so he had an award named after him. And he came back and screwed the whole thing up. Unfortunately, he only came in second place in his own award. Zack Sabre Jr. won the award once again. And he's won the award every year since 2014. Sorry, Brian, but Zack Sabre Jr. is a lot better at being you than you are. The Bruiser Brody Memorial Award for oh, Best Brawler. Oh, this ought to be classic. Best Brawler. The winner, who ended the six-year streak of Tomohiro Ishii, John Moxley. Oh, God damn it. I don't know who or what or why Tomohiro Ishii is. He's fantastic. He is great. Well, I don't know for sure one way or the other. But uh, so the Bruiser Brody Memorial Brawler Award has now become a garbage death match award for people who fucking use a lot of furniture and take bumps and thumbtacks. Well, if it was most garbage brawls, he would win. I don't know about best brawler, but again, I mean, looking at some of the other candidates here, there aren't really too many people. I mean, Walter's on the list, and I wouldn't really consider him a brawler. Well, yeah, that did. Oh, God damn it. Best flying wrestler. I agree with this one. Ray Phoenix. Well, I might have agreed before I saw him fucking miss everything he tried this past uh, Wednesday night, but we'll talk about that during the show review. It's, it's not about best execution. It's who flies the best? Well, he was definitely flying around. <laughs> I can say that for him. Most overrated. Bray Wyatt. 444. First place votes. Or is this first? These are the Section B awards. Let me just real quick. Oh, we're into Section B now. These are for a little while now. It's been Section B. I just want to see. uh, They're only determined by first place votes. Ah. So for most overrated, Bray Wyatt with 444 votes. I, I haven't rated him very highly since he got burned alive. Most underrated, Ricochet. Oh, Jesus Christ. Here's an interesting one for you. Rookie of the Year. Do you have any guesses or any thoughts? Um, We've mentioned this before. How do you really tell whether a guy's a rookie or not? Sometimes the Rookie of the Year has been wrestling for a few years, in which case that should disqualify him. I have no idea who they would say here. I think number two was really good. I'll say that. Anna Jay, I actually thought she was really impressive, considering she only had a handful of matches before she got on the AEW roster. But number one Rookie of the Year... Pat McAfee. Oh, which I didn't even think. Yeah, either did I, 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 I saw it. I don't even think of Pat McAfee as a rookie. He's so good. But yes, that, well, there, that works. Finally got one. Best non-wrestler. Now, this is an award that you have both won. You also won many, many times in the previous iteration of it as manager of the year. Yeah, he, he switched and got ahead of the times when there became no more managers and it became non-wrestler. Who do you think was the non-wrestler of the year? Heyman. Heyman came in second to Taz. I would have flipped that around. I'm sorry, but Heyman knocks it out of the park every time he's out there with whatever he's supposed to, except for unlocking handcuffs. (laughs) Um, Whereas, and it's not Taz's fault, but he's just been on that amateur production. So there's a lot of, been a lot of, goofiness involved best television announcer any guesses well god damn well i know that we would have voted for ian riccoboni and caprice coleman uh because they were the only ones that we didn't want to mute and throw a brick through the set when we watched um ian riccoboni for the record was ninth place ninth with 21 votes coming in after chris jericho and wade barrett and yugo savinovich what <laughs> I didn't even know Hugo was still alive, much less still doing <laughs> announcing. You mean Ian Riccoboni came in after a fucking deceased announcer? Who do you think came in first place? Uh, my normal choice would be just out of force of habit the last 25 years, say Jim Ross, but fourth he's place. had nothing to talk about. Fourth. Fourth place. Um, after Tony Schiavone. After t- t- Tony. I, all, Tony doesn't even speak, except when spoken to. Um, I, 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 I'm at a loss. Excalibur. Oh, (laughs) 
Here's what Dave wrote. Oh, my God. Mark Letzman, 40, a key player in Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, the most high-profile independent promotion, won a close race over two-time winner Kevin Kelly. Wait a, wait a minute. The most high-profile independent promotion. They were drawing 400 people at a fucking rec center. There's independent promotions in the Carolinas that draw 1,000 people to fucking parking lots. But they were high-profile. Letzman's role in talking about moves and backgrounds of wrestlers from all over the globe on Dynamite and Dark got him the award. It's a difficult role, with Jim Ross being the star announcer to the mainstream crowd, and Tony Schiavone being the voice of many fans' Nitro or even Jim Crockett promotions nostalgia of the late 80s and late 90s. It's also hard because of the wide variety of talent from all over the world, and with all different styles and gimmicks that AEW employs, not to mention so many that much of the audience isn't familiar with. All right. What, wait, was that a did that sentence end or just commit suicide in the middle of it? <laughs> what the? F <laughs> so they voted for this idiot in a fucking sock looking like an outlaw clown on network television, national cable at least, and, and, and calling matches like a fucking Mark in his basement voicing over VHS tapes. If you're just into someone yelling out the names of moves, I can understand it. But I find him unbearable on these shows. But anyway, a few more awards. Worst, Please hurry. The worst television announcer, Michael Cole. Well, at least there's something you can bond with over. I think Dave should name the award after him. The Michael Cole slash David Crockett Award for Worst Television Announcer. Hey, remember when the Worst Manager Award was named after Fuji? <laughs> that, that award went away, too. Because he won it like seven years in a row. Yeah. There are a lot of like old awards that went away, like Least Favorite Wrestler of the Readers and Worst Wrestler. For some reason, these awards went away. I Most disgusting promotional tactic. That's still here. I, no, that's is still that, here. Oh, it, well, well the, the field was wide open and the competition was fierce on this one. I will go past the best and worst major wrestling show because I don't think you'll really care about that. Best wrestling maneuver. They are actually neat. They were pretty much indistinguishable. The best wrestling show and the worst wrestling show I saw this year were pretty much right in the same ballpark. Best wrestling maneuver. <sighs> The Kenny Omega One-Winged Angel. Oh, good God. Of course it would be. The most disgusting promotional tactic. I'm going to read down from 10 to 1, okay? Okay. Number 10, WWE Drake Maverick firing storyline with all the real firings. Uh, there's not a number here, but hey, I assume I, this is number I don't nine. know why that was disgusting. Number 9, the Bushy Road handling of the death of Hana Kimura. Okay, I don't know what they did. Number eight, WWE continuing to employ and push wrestlers with credible sexual allegations against them. Okay, well, well, hold on. Uh, the, besides uh, the Riddler. Velveteen Dream. Ah, Velveteen Dream. Well, so there was two of them. Number seven, Dana White attempting to run a Native American reservation show in California to get around COVID restrictions. <laughs> that's actually that just that, des that deserves to be on a list of underhanded disgusting promotional tactics that's classic uh fucking old-time fight promoter that that actually fits the fucking suit here number six ray mysterio losing his eye number five i don't know whether that was a disgusting promotional tactic or just bad fucking booking yeah. by the way w wait i just thought didn't we see him not long ago with two eyes? It grew back. Do they do that? No. Well, anything could happen in the World Wrestling Federation. Grew Number back. five, AEW restarting Matt Hardy versus Sammy Guevara. <laughs> that wasn't a disgusting promotional tactic. They didn't promote that. They didn't. It would only be a disgusting promotional tactic if they had said, hey, somewhere during this match, we're going to fucking have Matt Hardy do something stupid so he gets brain damaged and then make him work on top of it. That wasn't a promotional tactic. That was a dumb decision made in, in the, on the sperm of the moment. Number four, 
WWE running in Saudi Arabia. And that's a disgusting promotional tactic. Number three, WWE stopping talent from third-party opportunities. That's an underhanded business tactic. I'm not sure if it's a promotional tactic. Number two, WWE operating for months without COVID testing. Uh, well, that, once again, was not a disgusting promotional tactic because they did everything they could to keep people from finding out about it. So that would be uh, more of a uh, an improper and malfeasant business practice. And finally, number one, WWE firing people during a pandemic during a year where they were setting record profits. Well, they're, they're just all over the WWE's dirty business, aren't they? Right. My favorite is still 1982, the most disgusting promotional tactic. The monster. No, 1982. That, Bob Backlund is WWF champion. Oh, that's right. That's right. The monster was 81. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. The monster in Los Angeles was 81 and just but putting the belt on Bob. Ba See, that's what I said. The early observer readers, they were the NWA guys. They were the diehards. Just having Bob Backlund as your champion was a disgusting promotional tactic. So we don't do this all day. Finally, two last ones. Please. Promoter of the year, and well, best booker, Tony Khan. We mentioned it earlier. Well, who were the runners up? What competition did he have? Number two, Ghetto. Number three, Nosawa Rongai. Who? I'm not exactly sure. Number four, Rosie Ogawa. Who? Number five, Sanshiro Takagi. Who? Uh, tied for number five, apparently, Paul Levesque. And number six for best booker, Hunter Johnston. Oh, well, thanks for coming, Hunter. Good God. Promoter of the year, Tony Khan. <laughs> That's the one I said he should have won. Best gimmick, Orange Cassidy. <sighs> oh, my God. What is the gimmick? Has anyone ever explained what that gimmick is? Here's the final one. And to me, this is the one that's the biggest indictment of the Observer readership, which I've been a part of for 30 years. Yeah, it's, that was like, we're wanting to resign from the club. Any club that would have us, I wouldn't be a member of. Best pro wrestling book. I'm going to read it from the end to the beginning. because I already know where you're going, but go ahead. Number seven, Master of the Ring, the biography of Buddy Rogers by Tim Hornbaker. Are you f so basically the best wrestling book that's been published in ages comes in at number seven. Number six, The Voices of Wrestling 2020 New Japan Year in Review. I don't know what the fuck that is. Number five, The Wrestling Observer Yearbook 1997 by Dave Meltzer. What? How can the, how can the fucking Observer Yearbook from 1997 win uh, be on the best book list in 2021? No, he just did a couple of uh, yearbooks with, uh, I think, Inside the Ropes magazine. They partnered together. And it's basically a collection of the previous articles that were in the 1993 or 1997 issues put in order. So it's... It's a reprint of old observers, but reordered. Okay, so that's that's two places better than the Buddy Rogers book, which is like saying that all the leftovers if from your refrigerator put in one pot and cooked to temperature are better than a meal at Morton's Steakhouse. Number four, Shamrock, The World's Most Dangerous Man by Jonathan Snowden. I have not read that because I like Ken Shamrock, but Jonathan Snowden's a Weasley piece of shit, and I wouldn't read anything else he ever fucking wrote. That's one of the problems with that book. Everyone says, fantastic book, but what a nut about Snowden. <laughs> Number three, and I didn't even remember this came out this past year, Under the Black Hat, My Life in WWE and Beyond by Jim Ross. I have not seen that as of yet. I should get that. Number two, and to me, with the Buddy Rogers book, this is the other candidate that should have won. Eighth Wonder of the World, The True Story of Andre Ooh. the Giant by Pat LaProd and Bertrand Bear. Yeah, well, Rogers, I like the Rogers book because I learned so much that I didn't know, but if a book would have to beat it, it would be that Andre book because it was just incredible. Yeah. Yes, but we're talking major, not only pieces of writing from major publishing, uh, a, a company in fucking Andre's case and fucking copious research in goddamn Hornbaker and Scott Teal's case and well-written, factual. What the fuck's number one? Number one, 
Young Bucks killing the business from <laughs> backyard to the big leagues by Matt and Nick Massey. So let me just say for the record, the Buddy Rogers biography, which is fantastic. The Shamrock book, which people have raved about. The Andre the book. The Andre book, which is maybe the single greatest wrestling biography just as a book that's ever been put out. None of them could match up to the soft, namby-pamby writings of the Young Bucks. That right there, that's why I said this is the biggest indictment of who's voting uh, for this. Two frustrated fucking over-the-hill teenagers that chew gum and can't get out of their fucking own backyard. People keep sending us uh, segments of that book because they want your reaction to it, so I've read parts of it. And it's soft. You can't compare that book to the Andre book. You can't compare it to the Buddy Rogers book. And from what I've heard about the Shamrock book, again, everyone says, Snowden, what a nut. <laughs> but it's a great book. I mean, that's the dilemma. Everyone's like, this guy, I don't want anything to do with this guy. But he wrote a great book. The Young Bucks. That says who's voting for these awards. Staring at each other's Peters on the cover. That's right. So that's that. That was the, uh, the majority of the 2020 Wrestling Observer Newsletter year-end awards the most prestigious year-end awards in all of wrestling. Those are so prestigious, I need to take a piss. Well, I believe, folks, there has been some pissing that has taken place during this slickly produced edit job right here, and now we're back. That's right. And our bladders feel better than ever. I have an email here about the Young Rock show. Um, We said last week, you know, we reviewed the debut episode last week we mentioned how a show about the childhood of a former pro wrestler drew two and a half times the audience that any pro wrestling show drew that week uh and and i guess episode two was down some in the ratings so it only drew about 1.75 times what any other wrestling show drew that week but um, one of the listeners sent an email because we'd asked the question. We wonder what the complete non-wrestling audience that's never watched wrestling, don't anything about the inside of the business, whatever, what they thought of it. Well, I got one for you before we talk about episode two. This is from Garrick from Michigan. Now, he gives his last name, and I believe it's a, an assumed name, possibly to stay ahead of the law, but he says on the experience, you asked for a non-wrestling fan's opinion of young rock. My wife of 20 years dislikes wrestling and combat sports, but absolutely loved the wrestling side of young rock as it reminded her of her childhood. My wife grew up alongside carnies in the eighties and nineties. The family business was selling posters, t-shirts and various doodads at fairs, carnivals and craft shows. It was an all cash business with lots of shady promoters, bootleg goods, and handshake deals. It was a very exclusive community with a social hierarchy and code words used around outsiders. This sounds familiar. For example, you never, never, never talk about your product suppliers in public. That guy behind you at McDonald's, his sister's neighbor might use that information to weasel in on your business. Her late father was the spitting image of Hillbilly Jim and lived the huckster gimmick 24-7. He was the only person I've ever met that was both totally full of shit and completely trustworthy and dependable at the same time. Being a kid coloring a picture on the floor while the adults drink and talk inside her shop, that's how she grew up and really enjoyed seeing that on TV. So now we know how the non-wrestling but inside Carney audience feels about the Young Rock. But I'm still, it, it still may be, I'm not sure a lot of people had the experience growing up around the Carney folks either, though. So we're, we're still, I, I want something from a pure, undiluted, uncontaminated source. You know what I mean? I guess. <laughs> okay, I've been waiting to talk to you about this. We didn't say anything to each other before we went on the air because I have a feeling when I saw that first scene of Young Rock, that nature boy Ric Flair is calling up John Taylor if John Taylor is still indeed Ric Flair's lawyer. And he's going to sue that production company. It looked more like Griff Garrison than Ric Flair. Where the fu Everybody <laughs> else looks halfway decent and they made Flair to be a fucking anorexia victim. What happened there? It looked like Terror Horizon when Paul Levesque first showed up in WCW. No, That's no. skinny. Yeah. He, no, he was still 20 or 30 pounds bigger than this guy. 
even even on his skinny days. Um, the fuck that I couldn't I couldn't unsee it after I saw it. I'm like, when the fuck did Ric Flair weigh 195 pounds? When did he wrestle Rocky Johnson during that era? Rocky in the Carolinas was Sweet Ebony Diamond. Well, now see, now you're you're going way too far into detail. I know details. this is the problem. I know, I know. But no, here's the thing. I mentioned there's things I like about Young, and I love the 80s soundtrack. And besides the flair actor, we had this discussion last week as to whether the historians in us are like, wait a minute, that couldn't have happened, or that's not correct, or whatever. Uh, But he said he's taking license with some of the stories from his childhood. I want verification from one of our uh, wrestling results researchers out there that Rocky Johnson pinned Roddy Piper in 1984 in the WWF. I need verification on that. Well, to be honest, they carefully got around actually saying that was the finish. You saw the one, the two, and then they cut to Rocky. Well, that's... <laughs> and he was saying, and three, and I beat... Same thing with Flair. Yeah. It was, you saw the one, the two, and then it was Rocky saying, and then it was three, and I beat him. Yeah. Oh... <laughs> uh, I- Rocky is coming off a beat full of sheet in uh, in this program. Uh, I think I like Ada better than anybody. And it just and we'll talk about the flea market show in a minute. But wrestling uh, history, historical inaccuracy aside, I'm I kind of like some parts of the show. It's cool that you know we know this guy. I know this guy personally in the past and worked with him. It's a TV show about him. It's peripherally about wrestling, but it's about their family. Also, it's kind of, it goes back quick. It's half hour show. I'm it's not Seinfeld. It's not always sunny. They're not, it's not a pure comedy show because they have the feel good moments and the, you know, the family bond and interaction and all that heartwarming horse shit. But they've also got the, um, you know, the 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 comedy part, and I like Rock's intros. Actually, the best part of the show, I think. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about the fucking newscaster guy. I think that's the worst. The worst part of the show is the newscaster guy and the whole Rock running for president in the future thing. If it was just Dwayne Johnson saying, "Here are memories and stories from my childhood," and giving little funny, you know, interludes in between the scenes. That'd be one thing, but the whole running for president thing, yeah. being an ongoing gag, and that newscaster guy sucks. That guy the, sucks. The writing for seen, him sucks. I'd seen somebody on Twitter, so that guy was a real newscaster. That's why I said that last week. But I think he played a newscaster in something, or he's playing a newscaster all right. But um, I like what you just said. If he was, hey, there's some stories from my childhood, and he pops in and out and does the voiceover or whatever, but Rocky's good. Rocky, Rock, the Rock, is good at everything he does. Whether it be delivering the lines or you know the little offhand asides or whatever, I'm not sure. As you said about the premise of him running for president, I thought that was the way they started the series, but I guess it's going to be the open of each week now. Um, you, you would, I mean, if they literally just had him on camera or even just had a voiceover of him saying what's happening, like. Just because you kind of have to put people in the zone of like, this is 1987 or whatever it is. Yeah. It would be better. There are shows I love, like Mad Men and The Sopranos, but there are elements, not to compare Young Rock to Mad Men or The Sopranos, but like, I think Mad Men would have been better without the whole Don Draper, who is he really? He stole someone's identity thing. And I think Sopranos would have been better without Dr. Melfi, without the whole going to the shrink thing, just as a look at the North Jersey Mafia, alleged mafia. It's a Hollywood thing. Allegedly. Allegedly. Never been any proof of this, but go ahead. But I think the same thing with this show. The whole rock running for president, sitting down with this really sticky, bad newscaster wannabe guy, that drags the show down. And then what when 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 Rocky's campaign guy comes in, don't talk about stealing. Oh, that goof too. Yeah, I mean that's the worst part of the show. The worst part of the show is everything that's not Young Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I got to talk about the flea market show. I know they're Hollywooden things up, but wouldn't it wouldn't it have made the same point if they had showed an actual what could have looked like an actual spot show at a flea market from '87 instead of 
Because there's never been, well, I, I won't say never. And I'm sure probably in Eastern Kentucky or over in West Virginia somewhere this has happened. But in those days, especially, you didn't set the ring up in between the, the flea market booths. I've run shows at flea markets, but the flea market wasn't actually going on around the immediate ringside area. And I would have to think, and I know they're trying to say that uh, they're telling the story that Rocky had been a big star, but now was wrestling, um, you know, on a small time basis. But whether that was a, a spot show up in Pennsylvania that the Samoans might have been promoting, I worked on some office shows in the 90s, even at, at the fucking Ag Hall in Harrisburg or whatever. He'd draw Allentown. Four, Allentown. He'd draw three or four or five hundred people. Um, I can't imagine Rocky Johnson worked at a flea market show in 1987 with 10 people. So it just it seemed like if they if they went to the trouble of setting up what looked like an actual independent wrestling show and shooting around that, it still would have been a small time thing without being because I'm I'm thinking a lot of people either will believe that they would have run a wrestling show with Rocky Johnson and the Wild Samoans in front of 10 people at a fucking flea market, or they'll say, well, this is all hokey and none of it's true. He could have run a show, the legitimate show he might have been at might have had 400 people in a fucking, you know, cattle barn at the fairgrounds, and it would have still looked low-key, but it would have been more, or low-budget, but it's still been more true to life. I don't know. Yeah, speaking of low-budget, who is the guy that had playing the promoter? Well, yeah, that was another thing because he said uh, that Young Rock said Rocky Johnson was doing a favor for his uncles, but then there was another promoter that stiffed him on money. Well, then the the I got a feeling if that had happened, the Samoans would have eaten the fucking promoter's face. <laughs> Usually, it was it, anyway. I don't know, but uh, it it we'll we'll see we'll see how this continues to move along. Rocky not coming off well, Rocky Johnson. No, um, but but happy. I mean, he's coming across happy, like a, he's like a happy, happy con artist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a happy guy. He's seen all those pictures of Rocky smiling and think, well, he must have had permagrin. If that Ric Flair didn't suck so bad, I'd probably be offended by the Roddy Piper they had. Well, the Piper didn't look too far off. Yeah. Like I said, if they didn't have that flair there, I think it would have yeah. stood out a little more. That was to take all the heat right off the top of the <laughs> of the show. Because <laughs> then when they had the fucking guy that he worked with the, at the flea market, what was it, the seagull or whatever? Yeah, who was looking like that in 1987, even in indie wrestling? No, nobody, but possibly they had costumes left over from the Always Sunny episode where they did the wrestling <laughs> show with Roddy Piper and then they were dressed, Mac and Charlie and birds Dennis were dressed up as as the birds of war. That's right. But I'll tell you what, folks, here's one thing that I can guarantee you. If you want to run a wrestling show at a flea market in front of 10 people or run a company that's generating hundreds of millions of dollars, the one thing that you need to do from the outhouse to the penthouse is keep track of your finances. You don't want to let QuickBooks and spreadsheets slow you down. It's time to upgrade to NetSuite. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information that you need when you need it. I hate having to call Featherbottom or Kippelman or Sharknado for my information. I want it right where I need it. You can ditch the spreadsheets and all the software you've outgrown, and you can upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, which is the world's number one cloud business system. If you want to get in the cloud business or any other kind of business, you need NetSuite by Oracle because NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more, everything you need, all in one place, so you can save time and money. Join the over 24,000 companies using NetSuite right now, folks. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour. Go to netsuite.com, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com slash J-C-E, netsuite.com slash J-C-E, and schedule your free product tour right now, folks. NetSuite. It's GMO free also. Did you know that, Brian? <laughs> I don't think there's any GMOs involved with NetSuite. There's no GMOs involved in NetSuite because they're on top of their business. You know, some of these products that we have to tell people that there's no, because I didn't know what GMO was until somebody, 
a guy named Bruce, as a matter of fact, sent me this, this email, the answer to your question, <laughs> what the fuck is GMO? GMO is a genetically modified organism. That's any organism whose genetic material has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. Monsanto is notorious for genetically modifying vegetable seeds to make them grow larger and faster. And that's from Bruce in Shartsville, Massachusetts. So, Shartz, folks, Shartsville? Shartsville, Massachusetts. It's right up there next to Boston. So, folks, we only advertise GMO-free products here on the experience, and NetSuite by Oracle is one of them. <laughs> folks, netsuite.com slash JCE. That's right. You're going to get that GMO <laughs> email in here one way or another. Well, God you? damn it. I just told you earlier, I finally found out what GMO was. And we didn't have any commercials today where we could mention that the, the product was GMO free. But I guarantee you, NetSuite has no GMO in it. That's right. NetSuite.com slash JCE. That's right. GMO free. Um, <laughs> I have an email here from Matt. And and I got a tickle out of this. I'm going to read it. And I, sh I I'm laughing because some of the young folks don't understand the way that things used to work. So there's a couple questions that we can answer here in this email. Hi, Jim. I grew up watching 90s wrestling and have older siblings who were wrestling fans in the 80s, but would only watch Jim Crockett slash WCW. I've recently been delving further into old territory tapes, including Mid-Atlantic and Mid-South. On a few episodes, there have been random inserts on other promotions telecasts of WWF footage featuring Andre the Giant. No preamble was given to explain these inserts, but I'm assuming that it was due to Andre attracting viewership if a match of his were advertised. Would this be done only if Andre was to be making an appearance in another territory, or would promotions, this is what tickled me, would promotions purchase tapes of Andre's WWF matches to air on their telecasts sporadically? if they needed a bump in ratings. How did the WWF feel at the time about snippets of their tapings appearing on other territories broadcast? Regards, Matt. Oh, Matt, there's so much to, to go over here. Um, first of all, I, no promotion, no wrestling promoter, especially in the territory days, has ever purchased footage of somebody's matches to put on their television program to begin with. Many of them stole footage. Uh, but nobody purchased tapes back in those days. And there was no bump in the ratings because, uh, Brian, I guess we've never said this out loud, but it, it, I guess people now wouldn't know this. The wrestling program, the regular weekly wrestling show that was on in your local hometown, whatever territory you lived in, on your local broadcast station, they never advertised any of the matches you were going to see ahead of time. Almost, unless, like, Bill Watts, every once in a while, if he had a fucking angle he was going to shoot, he'd say, next week for the Mid-South Tag Team title, so-and-so is going to face so-and-so, or whatever. But for the most part, I can't even think of a time where it was advertised ahead of time in Memphis. Um, the Whatever matches that you saw on the wrestling program, you first heard about when you were watching the open where the announcer said, hello, everybody, today we're going to see so-and-so. I'm, I'm not overstating that, am I? Can you recall in the territory days any but very sporadic, infrequent times they would promote a match uh, a week or two out on television? Very often they would promote the wrestlers. You know, next week, tune in, Tommy Rich will be here, plus this person and this person and this right. person. The matches, not... Really, I mean, the one Memphis example I was thinking of, and I couldn't remember it firmly happening, I'll ask you, Flair and Lawler in 82, did they promote the week before that Flair was, well, they wouldn't have promoted the match because they didn't know the match was going to take place. Until right. The angle. Yeah. It was an angle. No, because that's the thing is that uh, uh, it, it, it evolved organically, the match that day. I can't even remember whether they had said the previous week that Flair was going to be on television or not. But you're right. Usually, I mean, Watts did it, and usually that meant something was going to happen. Like with the WWF during, or WWF during sweeps weeks, you would get main event matches, but like Bruno and Zabisco was built up on TV for a few weeks. So when it was next week, it was going to be Bruno and Zabisco. It had been built up, and that was the cue to, 
you know, we're going to do a big angle. We're going to do something really big here. (laughs) But no, I mean, typically they didn't. And of course, we'll we'll get into it now with the Andre footage and footage coming out of the Northeast, why it was sent to the various territories. Well, the most famous Andre footage was the handicap matches that they sent. It was 1974. Andre had been appearing in certain parts of the U.S. for a couple of years since he'd come to to Montreal. He um, actually, uh, his first appearance, from what I was told by the building janitor, uh, Andre's first appearance in the United States was the old building, what was it, oh God, an auditorium or some type in Burlington, Vermont, because that was a spot show that they would run out of Montreal. And we were there for Raw in the 90s. And the old guy said, yeah, this was the first building that Andre the Giant wrestled in in the United States. But he'd also, because of um, a deal that Vern had with the Vachons, he had worked some of the AWA towns in the Midwest, and he'd been to Chicago, and he'd been to Indianapolis. But he hadn't made a, a complete tour of the United States. And so when Vince Sr. signed him in 74 to an exclusive contract, he became Andre's booker and he started booking him out to the other territories, the other promoters, they would get dates on him that kept him special as an attraction. And of course, Vince senior got a piece of it. And what they did was on the WWF TV tapings, they put Andre in against two or even three guys. I mean, there was uh, several tapes that they circulated of Andre doing Andre's spot, standing up with the guy when he had a headlock on him and the guy's feet wouldn't touch the ground and trapping the guys in the corner and giving them the big head butts of the butt bump. And then the um, the double or even triple leg scissors where he'd mare the guys over and he'd have a leg scissors on all three of them. Then he'd pick them up and do the big butt bump. They did those matches and then Vince Sr. would send those tapes out for the local televisions of the different territories whenever he was booked in. So you saw those, and and the promoters would keep them. And then every time that Andre might come in, they'd show the same ones. So those were the original Andre matches that at one point or another were on almost every territory's TV in the country. You know which one makes me cringe? Like, it just, I hate that they did it with these guys. There's a handicap match from L.A. of Andre squashing Gordman and Goliath. Gordman and Goliath, yeah. That pains me. <laughs> That's pain, that pains well, me at this great tag team destroyed by Andre. But here they did the same thing almost everywhere. Uh, Andre's first appearance in Louisville here and in, in most of the Tennessee territory was against uh, a, a heel tag team in a handicap match, Charlie Fulton and Bobby Main, who had been... The Mighty Yankees, I believe it was. Yes, they'd been the Mighty Yankees, but they got unmasked and they were leaving the territory. And Andre came in and beat both of them in the main event. And it was all Andre matches were cold matches in those days, meaning that they didn't have any angle uh, behind them. There was no grudge. There was no personal issue. It was just, here's Andre's coming in. And a lot of the territories, if they didn't have a big guy like Ernie Ladd or Don Leo Jonathan or somebody they could put Andre in in a single match they had a heel team that was probably leaving the territory so they'd put Andre in a handicap match against this main event heel team and the people would be like oh shit they were the tag team champions and they did this and that but they didn't know that they were on the way out of the territory so they'd do a job to Andre and they'd be gone and it didn't hurt anything uh but yeah Gordman and Goliath uh, classic example but that was one of the you know classic tag teams of all time the other one, beyond matches, the promo with Andre next to Vince, and Andre's on the crate, so he looks like he's 10 yeah. feet taller than Vince. <laughs> that went everywhere, too. Well, that that's another thing. You saw more promos, and that used to be a big deal. When you would see a promo of a star that was coming in, that's another way that the promoters work together, is that if Ernie Ladd was finishing up in Florida but he was going to be starting for Vince. They'd shoot interviews at the Florida TVs to send to Vince to air on WWF television or whatever the territories were. So you saw promos being sent back and forth more often because the promoters were not 
competitors, since they had their own territories and they knew that, it, okay, you know, you need a tape from me on so-and-so. Well, I'm going to need something from you one of these days. So it wasn't like they weren't breaking their necks to help each other out, but they would send tape and, and things like that. And another tape that was widely, and this is before home video, that w when you had to definitely get your footage from the promoter that you know of of the guy that's that he you know the promoter the guy's been working for because you can't just steal vhs from somewhere right there was no such thing the 1977 nwa world title change between funk and harley race in toronto that was not only taped for television for the toronto and uh, uh tvs up there but also they sent it around to all the nwa promoters and most of them ran it that's how everybody got to see that title change and normally, here in Memphis and the Tennessee Territory, they wouldn't have aired it except as new champion, and it was planned ahead. Harley had dates here in March uh, uh, all over the territory, so they showed that to build up for Harley coming in. But that tape was circulated for quite a while, and it was good quality of footage. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, when when... When I was running Smoky Mountain Wrestling or OVW, the WWF would send us tape. I'd call them and I'd say, hey, we've got the APA or we've got Big Show or we've got this guy or that guy uh, coming in for Six Flags or he's going to be here for a few weeks for the TV. So can you send me some matches down so I can promote him on the TV, show him uh, wrestling and or do a you know music video or whatever? Well, at first... <sighs> The the WWF people in the studio, they didn't really understand the wrestling business. And because the WWF had worked with so few outside promotions during the period of time that they were working there, this is, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, they didn't really understand. They didn't get a grip on it. They would send me matches with the talent that was coming in for me, but they'd cut off the finish because apparently it had been a rule... <laughs> that they were when they sent out footage to TV shows or news shows or whatever to promote appearances with their talent, they didn't want to see any WWF guys getting beat on television. So they sent me footage of the guys that I was trying to put over and promote, but cut off the finish without seeing them win the fucking thing, which is the whole reason to show the match. And when I called him, I said, the fucking footage is cut off. Oh, uh, that's that's what we're supposed to do. I finally, until I could get it straightened out and talk to Jim Ross, I think, get him to smarten him up, I was actually taking VHS tapes that I would record at my house of Raw and just pulling the fucking matches that I wanted of guys and putting them on OVW TV. Because why the fuck not, uh, since we're working with them anyway and training their fucking talent. But that was, uh, it, they lost the fucking plot on why footage was sent from territory to territory to begin with. If you've got a star coming in and he's going to be starting on April 1st, if you got footage from his previous territory of just matches of him just beating people in five minutes on TV, then you could show that for a week or two or three out ahead of time. And he's, you know, he, he's, he's made when he gets there. When the Midnight Express and I went to Mid-South Wrestling, we couldn't do that because Bobby and Dennis had not been together as a team and I wasn't their manager. So Watts flew us in a little over a month before we were supposed to start and had us do a match on each one of the five TV, actually flew us in twice, two different tapings. We did five TVs total of just us winning in three or four minutes to show before we actually started in the territory. If we'd had stuff from Memphis, we could have sent that, but we didn't, so we didn't. When when Smoky Mountain Wrestling and Memphis were working together we, with each other, we'd send tape back and forth. So it would just, you know, it, that's what territories used to do to help keep talent fresh and a constant flow and and juice up a guy's angle and and uh, a, or sometimes a star in a territory. It wouldn't have anything to do with promoter to promoter, but the star. I use him again, Ernie Ladd. Ernie Ladd might be at a. TV taping in Florida, but he might say, well, I'm going to work for Fritz in Dallas uh, next month. I need to cut a couple of promos. And they'd say, okay, Ernie, and they'd cut a couple promos for him and hand him the tape, and he could mail it to fucking Fritz. You know what was sent around everywhere? And, you know, we know the reason why. 
Gorilla Monsoon versus Baron Sakuna with Muhammad Ali running in and getting the airplane yeah. spin from Monsoon. Yes. Um, they sent that everywhere because they they wanted to promote the Ali Inoki, uh, you know, closed circuit uh, business. But at the same time, a lot of the promoters that didn't really care whether Ali and Inoki did any business or not, and maybe, you know, hadn't jumped into the closed circuit thing. They just wanted to see a wrestler beating up Muhammad Ali on their wrestling program because it made to the fans, it made wrestling look bigger to tie it back to Watts. Watts somewhat regularly brought Andre the giant in, especially for big shows. So if you watch mid South TV, what exists and what doesn't currently exist on the network, but when he brought in for the Superdome, you know, JYD versus Michael Hayes, he brought in Hogan versus Andre. Yeah. So that footage from New York aired of the build up to that match, which then happened in Shea Stadium, what, later that week. And then when he had Boy, Andre and Hogan had a pretty good week that week. They were a Superdome, Shea Stadium. Yeah. Fuck. And then in, I think, 82, when Watts had Killer Khan working for him, it was natural when Andre came in to book Andre and Killer Khan. So they aired that footage of, I think, when Andre was doing the promo on crutches. And Fred Blassie and Killer Khan came out and attacked him. So regularly with Andre, especially with Bill Watts, he would air the Andre stuff from New York. Yeah. Well, and and Watts also Watts was way ahead of everybody else in booking main event matches on his television program. And you've seen the six mans out there. What was it? Andre, Dusty, and JYD against the Samoans and Ernie Ladd. The Samoans and Ernie Ladd, and that was a television match. But uh, whereas the the primary rule was you don't give away main event matches on free television in those days a lot of the promoters went all in on that like Vern Gagne you know there was one competitive match per year on AWA television and it usually was an angle and elsewise it was squash matches and fucking promos but Watts with the the mind he had for finishes and and this was Florida they did the same thing in Florida you would see the funks and the briscoes in a TV match when business called for it, when they had something to, to to do. And as long as you were creative enough with finishes, Eddie Graham, Bill Watts, et cetera, you could have your main event match on television. You could have, it could be a good match and you could have a finish that would shoot off from that match, either make you want to see that match booked back in the arenas and pay to see it. Or what he really did a lot was have a main event match and then do something in the finish to involve someone else or take it in a different direction. So the match he booked in the arenas might involve different people and he could save the rematch of what you just saw on television for a big show down the road. The very first Midnight Rock and Roll Express match that ever happened was on Mid-South Wrestling Television for free. And he told us flat out, he said, you got seven minutes, show them what it's going to look like. And then the Russians, who the rock and roll were working a program with to get over to come face us, the Russians ran in, did a DQ, and the Russians got some heat on the rock and roll, and it built their matches. But in the back of people's minds, because they just seen seven minutes of the midnight in a rock and roll, shit, we, we want to see some more of that. Wonder when that's going to happen. So he could use those main events to lead to better business rather than giving away matches for free and losing it. Bill Watts aired Lawler versus Andy Kaufman as a precautionary tale of why actors shouldn't get involved with wrestling. He didn't do, didn't do anything to yes. build up the match or talk about Andy Kaufman. It was more like, look at what happens when one of these guys gets in the ring. You know, this guy's a joke. Look at this. Yeah. Really putting down Andy Kaufman. Lawler shut him up. One of these Hollywood types that wants to knock wrestling. To the best of your knowledge, did any other territory air that footage? It was on Letterman, obviously, but I'm talking about the actual wrestling shows. I don't think so. Because, well, think about it. There was no reason for him to, because most of them probably, Eddie Graham, I don't think, was going to book Andy Kaufman, Fritz Von Erich. That's why that Andy had to come to Memphis, because Lawler and Jarrett were the only ones that would book him in, on a real wrestling show and let him do his stuff and figure out a way to where he didn't make the business look silly. Because, you know, I mean, watching it, watching it now, just watching the match, it still stands up as a match, and it looks like that Lawler probably could have fucking very well hurt him. But you don't understand that in the context of as it was happening at the time, 
the first big celebrity crossover where a, a, a celebrity, actually a non-athletic celebrity, just an actor, or whatever, actually wrestled in a high-profile match, the one thing that the promoters wouldn't let happen, Vince Sr. wouldn't book him, nobody wanted to make the wrestling business look stupid or fake, and it actually did more to make the business seem real than anything they did for the next 30 years. Because the way that Lawler was a genius at psychology and speaking, and Andy Kaufman was a genius at psychology and speaking, he knew what he was doing. If he'd have been a fucking athlete, he could have been a wrestler. They made people believe this thing was legitimate. And I was there that night. The people, when, when Kaufman was laying there in the ring, stretched out, they legitimately thought, and the, here comes the ambulance. The fans legitimately thought that Lawler had broken his neck and they were happy about it. And when he was on the stretcher, they were throwing garbage and balled up popcorn bags and fucking Cokes. Fuck you, you Hollywood fuck. That serves you right. They, if, if they could have, without the cops there, the people would have actually come up and turned his fucking stretcher over. How many? And, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was, I was just, that was, that was the one thing that one would have thought would have exposed wrestling. But in, instead, it did more to make people think, well, wrestling may be fixed, but that was real. I've told a story. My, my, uh, cousin's wife was the head nurse at the floor of the hospital that they took Kaufman to. And she came home at night. Oh, can you believe it? Holy shit. Lawler must have really hurt him. Jim, be careful. They're always at me. Be careful. Anyway, you could get hurt. Now they believe the shit. Right. And Watts showed it because it served his purpose of saying, look what happens. Like you said, when one of these clown actors gets involved in our business, but nobody else, it, it wasn't going to make them any money and they didn't have a hard on to show it just to prove that the guy really got hurt. So that's why it didn't air anywhere else. But Watts showed it to make people more believe in wrestling. And, and I'm still gobsmacked that the most preposterous angle with the most ridiculous looking person, Andy Kaufman, was the most legitimate looking and perceived angle done in wrestling on a mainstream basis for the fucking next two or three decades. And it wasn't, in, it, a lot of people still believed it until the movie. How many NWA world title changes actually aired in all the territories? Cause I can think of ones well, that didn't, like when Flair lost to Kerry Von Eric, that didn't air. I mean, it aired in a lot of places where world-class aired, but a lot of territories didn't air the actual match or footage of the match. Well, let's let's go down the list. After 1977, Toronto Race and Funk that did air and that was taped. Um, the the change in uh, in '81, the change is well, even before that, the Baba changes didn't air in America. Well, but you can't expect them to. Well, it was in the magazine, so I guess you should just at least say that they didn't air here. Well, the, yeah, they did not air because that was basically Baba with Briscoe and with uh, Harley, right? Had twice with Harley, <laughs> twice with Harley, had come up with the amount of money that it, you know, that it took to get the NWA to say, okay, you can have it for a week or two while Harley's in Japan, and that made everybody happy. But of United States-based title changes, they aired obviously both Dusty and Flair in the Carolinas. But they, the NWA knew at the start that Dusty was going to be a short-term champion. And I'm sure it probably aired in fucking St. Louis or whatever. Um, Georgia. Georgia, uh, yeah. Georgia for Flair and for Dusty. And also St. Louis. Um, and then here's the thing. After that, it started getting, you know, a little territorial. To where, yes, when it was convenient, when the NWA champion was coming in for dates, the particular territory might air the title change. But what Starcade '83 and and um and then pretty much Jim Crockett had a hold of the belt, and you could get title defenses for a few years, but nobody else was getting a title change, and the other TVs 
you know, the other promoters started realizing this. It was like, well, why are we promoting his fucking guy? So they're uh, in the six in the fifties and sixties. I believe if the if the technology had existed and the wherewithal to send this out multiple copies easily, et cetera, et cetera, probably every time the title changed, you would have seen it on television. But by the time the eighties came around and easier transport of video, not film, and et cetera, um, it was starting to get too territorial. All right. I think we tackled that topic. Well, here's a topic that we can cover. If you've been stressed out by all the the things that we've just said and tearing your hair out and, and you need somebody to talk to to sort this all out, our friends at BetterHelp. Folks, BetterHelp, without doubt, has been one of the, our longstanding sponsors here on the program. We've had so much feedback from so many of the Cult of Cornet followers and listeners that have said they've been helped by speaking to somebody at BetterHelp. It's not self-help. It's not a crisis line. It's professional counseling done securely online. With a broad range of expertise, you can log on to your account anytime, send messages and receive them from your counselor. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, no waiting rooms, no going out in public, no encountering the 7,000 variants of COVID. The folks at BetterHelp are committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. They make it easy and free to change counselors if you need, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. So BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Remember, it's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. If you go to BetterHelp.com slash J-C-E, then you can get 10% off your first month's services. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Folks, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and experienced listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash jce do you need help on what you're doing this week or have you got it under control you and kippelman and sharknado over there do i need to send hotchkiss up no that's all right he is not officially a part of the arcadian vanguard team and we are better for it well yay you know what they say there's no i in team who says that a lot of people okay well this week on the arcadian vanguard podcast network get information about all shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. The latest episode of Charting the Territories with Al Getz and John Boucher is out right now at chartingthepodcast.com, or look for Charting the Territories wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The boys take a deep dive look at Skandar Akbar, the wrestler, and of course, the manager from 1977 on. So if you want to hear some Mid-South wrestling, some Tri-State wrestling, McGurk Watts history, centered around Skandar Akbar, check it out today. They also talk about Butch Reed and a whole lot more. Once again, chartingthepodcast.com or look for Charting the Territories wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Want to make mention the latest episode of the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review Podcast is available right now at MidSouthPod.com, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Me and Mike Mills review another week of Mid-South Wrestling from October 7th, 1983, the dark days of Mid-South Wrestling before all that Memphis talent came in. Oh boy, what an episode. Including the debut video, we play the audio, it is not on the WWE Network, the debut video announcing Leaping Lanny Poffo coming in, a truly bizarre I think video. I remember that. I will fight for what's good and what's right. It's just, it's bizarre, and he has a kid on his shoulders, and I don't know what the hell's going on. But hear it today at MidSouthPod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> I believe that's the starting horn. So we'll tell everyone right now, we are currently working on the latest Super Podcast, and I mentioned, I think last week, we we'll have some exciting announcements from Arcadian Vanguard coming in the weeks ahead, and part of what we're doing right now is getting ready to bring the Super Podcast to everyone more regularly, more episodes, more content, but stay tuned. We'll have some announcements within the next few weeks about things going on behind the scenes in Arcadian Vanguard, 
but go through the archives today. Will you have any news on that investigation that's going on from the state? 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Go through the archives. And for any investigations, contact the law office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. The mothership! Oh, God damn it. I had just figured it was easy to breathe again. Well, things have gotten hotter in the wrestling war, Brian. Shots have been fired. People are leaping. We're getting jumps again. Is this going to be a, 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 the harbinger of things to come? All the talent jumping back and forth? Or do you think this is a one-way jump? I don't know. Obviously, you're talking about Paul White, formerly known as The Big Show. <laughs> Never to be known as The Big Show again. That's right. Cause- Because it's trademarked by the WWE. Jumping to AEW, something that not a lot of people expected. And there are similarities and differences to the jumps that happened in the 90s between WWF and WCW. We'll talk about that. But I don't know. I mean, this is a situation where he was clearly offered more than Vince McMahon was willing to pay him at this stage in his career. And he took it. Can't blame him for that. No. But I don't know what that says about other situations. Randy Orton stayed with the WWF and signed a long-term, I think, five-year contract because he got a better deal and he wanted to stay there. So when it comes to guys that are in the middle of their careers, I don't know. You know, when the jumps happened in the 90s, right? the first batch of jumps to WCW, Hogan, Savage, to an extent Gene Okerlund and Bobby Heenan, but really Hogan and Savage, we look at them, we think, oh, they were at the end of their career, they were older, or they were younger than the big show is now. Yeah. And then the next batch, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were well younger and in the middle of their careers. So it is a little different. That's the big question. Are there going to be guys that jump who are in the middle of their careers and are stars? Moxley fit that criteria. Big show, not to take anything away from him, but he doesn't really fit that. He's not like a hot wrestler of the moment. He's more of a wrestling star of the past generation. He's a he's a big name. He's a big name, and what Tony Khan bought was a bunch of publicity. And I'm I'm not going to knock show. I've known show for 25 years or whatever, and he's been wonderful. Um, he's he's once again just the due to the fact of the generation that he comes from, and that there were so many more people watching wrestling at that time than there are now. He's a bigger mainstream recognized name than almost anybody today. Now, the the problem is that I can can pretty much tell you how he got away from the WWE because this has been Vince's Achilles heel, soft spot, weak spot, blind spot, whatever. When when Hogan jumped, when Savage jumped, in this instance now, in, in a number of them, Vince starts thinking that somebody's over the hill, past their prime, too old, need to be moved down, somebody needs to come up and take their place, whatever, without bothering to make sure that the talent that he's trying to move out is in, on the same page. That's the same reason that Savage left. I, I was the one that filled in for Savage doing a, a color on Raw when Savage left with no notice. And we were... Where was it the night we found out we were that goddamn we were in the Poconos doing a raw taping at one of the resorts up there that had the heart-shaped jacuzzi tubs in the rooms. But I'm I'm in the Poconos by myself having just done raw. No room service, the restaurant closes at nine o'clock up there, and I'm in a fucking hotel room all by myself with a heart-shaped jacuzzi. That was a fun night. But Savage left because it was like, fuck, I don't want to retire. I'm not ready to be done, etc. With Hogan, it was the same thing. He wanted to move Hogan down. He thought Hogan's time had come. And Hogan said, I can get a bunch more money from these suckers down here, which kind of another thing that Big Show probably said, because you know he just called Jericho. Said, hey, how much will this fucking Mark offer me? Vince probably and the WWE made an offer to Big Show, I'm sure, that they felt was good for them, but not for Big Show. 
they were, I'm sure Vince was probably thinking, well, it's been 20 years. Paul will want to stay here. We'll make him an ambassador. We'll sign him to a moderate contract where he can make appearances or whatever, but his wrestling days are done, maybe except for a special occasion. And they made him a financial offer, I'm sure, that reflected that standpoint. And Big Show looks at him and goes, well, I could do that, or since I'm pretty much done with wrestling anyway, because he's, he's 50 and he knows it. He's had injuries. It's not like he's going to wrestle for even five more years or anything on a full-time basis. He hasn't been doing that for some time. But he has to look at that offer and say, well, if I'm done with fucking wrestling... Why don't I just cash in and get a big fucking deal from the billionaire down there? Because he knows very well that in two years, Vince would take him back, put him in the Hall of Fame or whatever, because this is not going to be a a business changing move. It's going to it's going to get AEW a lot of publicity. And we'll talk in a minute about how they might can use him. But it's going to get AEW a lot of publicity. It's not going to hurt WWE's business one iota. Vince even said to me in the Midnight Express, we talked to him in 86, and I've heard him say this to other guys or heard him heard other guys say he said this to him. If you don't want to take my offer, pal, use my offer against Jim Crockett or whoever to, to get more money. Because Vince always says that, if especially if he thinks that it, he's not going to get the guy, because then he knows, well, it, I'll, he'll remember that I said that. And he'll remember maybe if he does use it to get more money than when I want him in the future, Vince is always thinking ahead. It's not just now or never do or die with him. He knows he'll make an impression and get you sometime. So the point is <clears throat> WWE probably made an offer to show based on him being a 50 year old, almost retired former wrestling star. Whereas Tony Khan was willing to open up a checkbook to get a big major mainstream wrestling name and get a lot of publicity and a lot of attention over it. It's not going to hurt WWE's business one iota that show is not there because he's barely been there to begin with for the past few years. And now we come to the part where is it going to help AEW's business and in what kind of intangible way? Because it, even if there was a box office, it's not going to help that. Big Show being on... An AEW event is not going to sell any more tickets, probably, than they were going to anyway, because, <clears throat> unfortunately, one of the catch-22s is, with this new, younger, hipper, we like wrestling because it's silly and funny audience that votes for My Little Dog Pockets and the young dick watchers and uh, whatever and all the awards, Big Show's not cool to them. So do you think I he's a bigger star than Jericho to the casual fan? Probably, probably because he was used in a, a higher position in the real attitude era in the last days, of the attitude era than Jericho was when he came in right on the, on the end of it. He's been in major television programs you know, as a, a just that picture of him, the 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 sight of him, because the world's largest athlete, whatever, stands out. You probably yes. It is a little reminiscent of when he first appeared in the WWF or WWE, because he debuts in that cage match, and the announcers are like, "It's Paul White! It's Paul White!" <laughs> and everyone's saying, "Who?" Because they couldn't say he was a giant. Yeah. And now we're back at that point. They can't call him the Big Show. They can't call him the giant, so he's just Paul White again. And therein lies one of these problems, and that's what Vince designed when he wants to copyright everybody's name, is you can't go and use the name that you're known by worldwide for somebody else. So unless they see the picture combined with the name, or unless they're a real hardcore fan that knows that that uh, big show's real name is paul white there's a an obstacle but he, tony khan jumped at the chance to buy some publicity and that's what he got and the the but the audience that he's targeting was already there they already know that the big show's name is paul white and they're all uh, you know fucking freaking out about it the people who don't really watch his program probably still don't know that the big show is going to show up on that program because they don't know who Paul White is and they ain't watching that program. 
here's the problem. They painted themselves into a corner. It, <sighs> WWE made a, a deal to Paul White based on what he was worth to them. And, and that wasn't suitable to Paul. And that's his choice. But Tony Khan paid him a bunch of money. Can he get it back? And how can he get it back? They've already announced that Paul and Tony Schiavone will be the announce team on a YouTube show. Well, an announcer, he shows well-spoken, he's intelligent, he probably can announce, but is that the thing that you would first have in the top of your mind when, oh, Big Show's coming to AEW, he's going to be an announcer? He's never done that before in his life. What about the visual? What about the visual of him even sitting at an announce desk next to, and we know the AEW talent, is on the smaller side of any talent in any wrestling company in the world. So, going to be like Sting. He's going to have to contribute in other ways because he's not going to wrestle every week on television or even, you know, every pay-per-view probably as he's been part-time for some time. So, can he agent? Can he be a producer? Well, probably he's got plenty of experience, but... Even though, I mean, they've got a bunch of people with experience there. Jim Ross, Jake Snake Roberts, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard. It doesn't seem like they're listening to any of them. So what can Big Show tell Felix to improve his game that Felix is going to listen to? Or Pockets? Or Dwarf Dong Sucker? What about a manager? Jake's a manager. Tully's a manager. Arn's a manager. Can you see that visual? Here's the Big Show. He's managing. Fucking who? Who would he not make look like a an idiot and a small child standing next to him? Well, again, they announced that he's coming in to be a commentator on their new YouTube show. And the way they put it, I think, was that he's been licensed to wrestle. Which you got to think will be every now and then for a special occasion, but... Okay, who? Here's, a, here's another corner that Tony Khan's painted in, himself into with his Tala roster of, of grade schoolers. He's bought publicity in Big Show. He has, he has signed a, one of the biggest available wrestling names currently living to a contract to work for him. What the fuck can he do? It, when Vince McMahon signed Big Show, he had Kane, he had Undertaker, he had Mark Henry, he had Stone Cold Steve Austin, Triple H, The Rock, Mick Foley, on and on. Who on the AEW roster could you match the Big Show with to forget about even a visually believable to even draw any money? And especially knowing the Big Show will be a huge baby face. Because he's just signed and they always love stars when they come in. So look at the roster. Brian, you got an AEW talent roster in front of you, don't you? I don't. Can you find one? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I know who works there. Okay, let's 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 show. let's go down let's go down the list. Let's go down the list. John Moxley versus Big Show. Fucking they'll probably do that at some point, but good lord. Um, uh, I would love, I would love to see a finish meeting between Big Show and, and Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang. So Olivier and Big Show, no. Team Taz, Cage, maybe Starks, probably not. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my notes from the TV show. Obviously, Sting versus Big Show. Well, we don't want to do that, do we? For a variety of reasons. Darby Allen versus Big Show. Santana and Ortiz could be Gordman and Goliath. And Big Show could be Andre. They're going to put them in a tag match with someone smaller. Adam Page? Cody? That's... Uh, I come back to that Cody versus Big Show is the one match that they could probably have and work and not be an offensive clusterfuck because both those guys know what they're doing. But then Cody's uh, the closest thing to a baby face they have, even though he's got a bitchy wife that throws water on basketball legends. 
Lance Archer, but it just took him 20 minutes to beat a guy that's a foot shorter and 100 pounds fucking lighter. You know what would happen in that Lance Archer-Paul White match? He would grab Paul White by the arm and climb up the ropes, and then he would walk across the ropes to the middle of the ring and do a backflip. Because he does that in every match now. I bet you he would. And if, and if, at, at one point, if, uh, the old big show, he might have just walked out from under him. But, um, but he, you know, if I can ask you another way of looking at this. You said that Tony Khan did this for the publicity, and he got a lot of publicity for it. They announced on Twitter that Paul White is all elite. And everyone said, oh, my God, you know, we didn't even notice that he wasn't there anymore. Like, no one, you know, it was a weird reaction from a lot of people. And a lot of the hardcore AEW fans aren't very happy about this. But let's take that out of the equation for now. They announce on Twitter that he's joined the company. Tony Khan puts out a statement that he's going to be a commentator on the new second YouTube show, as well as occasionally wrestle. And then there was some kind of quote that, you know, Paul White agreed that this is the best wrestling company in the world. There was some kind of fluff <laughs> statement there. And then, not to spoil the review, they kind of had a little image of him on the screen at one point, at the bottom, in the bottom left corner, I think, saying that he's going to be doing something on YouTube in a few weeks. Wouldn't they have gotten more publicity if they waited a week until it was a live dynamite and just had him walk out? And have him walk out and, and people across the country be shocked on television. Right. You would have gotten more publicity because everyone would be on Twitter. Oh, my God, the big show's there. Good or bad. He's there. He's, well, that, what's going on? That would have been a way to do it. But then you'd have to have some type of self-restraint and control over yourself instead of just being proud of every time you buy a shiny new bauble, you got to crow about it. I said it before. It's like the kid in the movie The Toy. You know, he goes into the toy store, he sees Richard Pryor as the janitor, he says, I want him! <laughs> I want that! I want that man to come live with me and Jackie Gleason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's the problem. And, and, you know, once again, I'm glad for show that he's getting getting a big contract. Well, not that he hadn't had a big contract before, but he's getting this big contract from this guy. Um, But what in the world, and... <sighs> What in the world can he do there? And that's not saying that he's talentless and can't do anything. What can he do in this environment? In this environment that they've built where everything's silly and it's a bunch of gymnasts and there's no credibility and nobody's going to, nothing makes sense. And now we've got the big show as an announcer. And that's the- On YouTube, on the second on YouTube. YouTube show. Yeah. And- and you asked, is this going to start jumping back and forth? No. The answer is the reason why Randy Orton stayed with Vince, because he still wants to work, I'm sure, at least five more years and possibly on and off after that for that amount of money and call his own schedule. And he knows that the WWE is going to be there and in position to pay him and push him. And it's the biggest company. And he's not done with his career. Big shows like, okay, if I, this is the last thing I ever fucking need a year or two of this. And I'm fucking, I was going to be done anyway. So it's gravy for him. But it, so like you said, Vince, they're going to have to be careful for the next couple of years till whenever happens, happens with this company. Um, they're going to have to be careful that they're guys that are aging out, that they don't really want to re-sign for any major amount of money or give a top push to they're going to have to be careful how they talk to them, you know, and, and maybe give them a little bit extra to stick around. But then again, they may not care because as I mentioned, it's not like it was in WCW where it's their neck and neck and, and somebody could pull ahead at any minute. I wouldn't be surprised if Vince didn't fucking well, fine. Let Paul take the guy's money. What's he going to do down there? Cause they see it's not going to affect their business. Yeah, and once you start signing guys who are not in the middle of their career but have a name that they can't even use off that TV, you got to be careful. Before you know it, you turn into TNA. Well, exactly. And and there's the situation is that the majority of the names that the average wrestling fan knows are over the hill and outside the ring positions in AEW, and and they're having to stand around and watch these goofs do whatever the fuck it is they call wrestling and it it doesn't 
it doesn't attract the viewers that know those legends because they want to see wrestling. And apparently it doesn't fucking impress the people who vote for these Cirque de Boucher awards and the observer for the legends to be there because they vote for all the people that these legends wouldn't have spit on in their fucking active days and would have laughed at. So he's just, he's collecting people to put in this thing. It's like having a, a million pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, but it's five or six different puzzles. You got all these pieces, but it doesn't make one coherent picture. It anyway, that's the thing. I don't think there's going to be any jumping back and forth. I don't think that the WWE is going to take anyone from AEW, not only because they wouldn't want them most of the, uh, most of them, but because they don't want to set a precedent that you can work for them and then come work for us. And they've done that with other companies in the past on an unofficial basis, and they'll do it here. Um, and I don't think that anybody in their active career, unless they're either so low on the totem pole that they just want any kind of a break, or unless they're the occasional, apparently goof like this Moxley is, that this is the kind of wrestling he's wanted to do all along, and now he gets to do it, and good for you, and I'm sure they were happy to see you fucking go from the other place if you were constantly bringing up thumbtacks and exploding barbed wire, uh, there's not going to be any fucking major going back and forth. This is, it is what it is. And they, they have bought a wonderful fucking designer custom made vehicle that they have no idea how to drive and don't have a road that will support it. And they can't use its name and they can't call it by its name. Hey, one other question for you. Obviously, if you are a WWE guy who wants a cozy lifestyle and you live in Florida, AEW is a perfect place for you to end up. You'll get a nice payday. Yeah. You have a boss who really wants to be your friend. Show already does live in Florida. Exactly. Yeah. And you work at most two nights every two weeks. <laughs> After the pandemic, maybe it'll go back to once a week. But they were not looking at house shows. They were not doing house shows. It's a really easy schedule. It's a comfortable life if you live in Florida. With that said, Tony Khan, because he's living off his dad's money, has unlimited capital because his father is a billionaire. He has money to throw around. They have not been able to break away and expand their audience at all. No disrespect to the former Big Show, but I don't think he's someone who's going to, especially as a commentator on YouTube, he's someone who's going to do much to expand their audience. Maybe it could have done a little bit more if you had him just show up on the show, like Medusa with the belt, just to surprise everyone, to shock everyone. Yeah, and this was a taped show from the previous week. Yeah. So they could they could have just held him till next week, had him walk out live and with Shaq and on he the would show. Have been in the same building with Shaq. It would have been perfect. But anyway, Tony Khan has all this money. He needs to do something to make things pop in some way. And it's a cozy, cozy lifestyle. How much money would he throw at John Cena? And would John Cena ever consider it? No, I, I don't. He's on TBS. He's hosting a show on TBS. I keep seeing commercials for. Yeah, but think about this. Cena is such upper stratosphere. Apart from above big shows pay grade, almost everybody but Hogan, Austin Rock. You would need to be the son of a billionaire to be able well, to afford him. But what I'm saying is Vince has his catalog. Vince has all the matches. Vince has his history. He's working in Hollywood. He's doing regular television. But if he wanted to have anything to do with a wrestling company for money or anything else, he would stick with Vince because you can still exploit all that stuff that his whole career has been with Vince. And I, and I just don't seem... He doesn't need the money. I don't see him taking a step backwards. Hi, John. This is Tony Khan. Hold on. Let me put down my white claw. This is Tony Khan. <laughs> I'll offer you more than Vince. I'll let you keep your merch. I'll let you do any outside projects you want. But you have to wrestle four matches a year for me. And do <laughs> promos. It's kind of like Hogan going to WCW. Well. On paper, it's like, wow, they're really throwing a lot of money at Hogan, and he's not even like peak Hogan right now, although he would have a renaissance in a sense. But it kind of opened the door for WCW to a lot of people. If it's Cena, 
and you have nothing but money. I mean, it's your dad's money, but you have nothing but your dad's money. And you have the ability to be creative with what kind of deal you offer him. Why not throw a shit ton of money at him? Maybe you could even get TNT to pick up a little bit of it. If you can get them to book him for some more stuff, he's doing something on TBS. Let him keep his merch. You keep 100% of your merch. Well, they, they almost did that with Hogan and WCW. They lost money every time they sold a Hogan t-shirt. Yeah, and then it got to the point, actually, where there were stories where people would go and buy, like, a Ric Flair action figure, and when they would see the scan at KB Toys, it would say Hulk Hogan. Yeah. So he was getting credit <laughs> for stuff that wasn't even his. But, listen, you have the ability to make a really creative deal for Cena and only use him a few times a year and just have him shoot promos in Hollywood or whatever and send them in. I don't know. Would he consider that? He, Vince owns the catalog. Vince doesn't own the name. I don't know. I don't know about that. Those are the two big ones out there, Cena and CM Punk. I mean, The Rock, but I don't think The Rock is a... I think The Rock will probably put an investment group together and buy WWE more than he will show up. I'm glad you... I thought you were going to say buy AEW. I was going to say he's got more business sense than that. Um, But, and once again, this is no disrespect to Big Show. If it was 20 years ago, this would be phenomenal because he would be just starting his career. And it, well, I've told you a story. I almost got him first before WCW. And as soon as you saw the guy that you were like, holy shit, this is money. Yeah, he was at Dennis Carluzzo's convention for the NWA tournament, November 19th, 1994. I took a picture of him there. Yes, he was there because Larry Sharp brought him to meet me. Now, yeah, Hildebrand told me, he goes, go take a picture of that guy. He's going to be a star. And I went up to him. He was just some giant guy. He was skinny, walking yeah. around. I took a picture of him that day. He wasn't very happy. He didn't seem very <laughs> pleased, but I took a picture of him. He posed for me for a second, and that was the very first time I saw him. And then when I saw him as the giant a year later on TV, I was like, oh, my God, that's the guy from Dennis's he convention. Had, he had no idea what he was getting into, right? And and Dennis Corlusa, for the folks who haven't heard the story, Dennis was running a convention in what what town in New Jersey? Cherry Hill. Cherry Hill. And I've got a table there, and I'm signing autographs and everything, and Larry Sharp came in because Dennis Corluzzo had been um, partners with Larry Sharp in the Monster Factory. The, the WWA. Uh, yes. Um, Larry Sharp had one of the first wrestling schools, the Monster Factory, and then Dennis's WWA World Wrestling Alliance, they'd use some of Larry Sharp's trainees on the undercard, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway... Larry comes in that morning and says, I got a guy you got to see because I was, even though I was running Smoky Mountain at the time, I was still, I was working for Vince, right? Um, he said, I got a guy you can see, you, you got to see. I've just, I, he's had a couple of lessons. He has his first match next month, but he's seven feet tall. And he's this net. I said, is he in town? Yeah. So we'll bring him. Let me see him. So he, he said, I'll have him here this afternoon. Come back later on. There's Larry and in walks fucking Paul White behind him and he blocked out the entire fucking doorway. And we shook hands, talked for a couple seconds. And I told him, I said, Larry, I said, his first match is next month. Yeah. Tape it, send it to me. I will hand it to Vince McMahon and he'll have a contract. Right? It's that simple. Okay. Well, what happened was Hulk Hogan found out about Paul White and he never had that first match. They snatched him, signed him up without him ever having a match, and took him to Atlanta and trained him in secret, which is why he was the shits for the first year or so, besides being a good athlete for that size, because he'd never actually worked in front of people. And that's also how we got Giant Singh. Because I was, I, afterwards, I was like, Larry, what the fuck? You told me he was mine. I was going to get credit for this one. I was going to go to me. So three years later, he finds another fucking seven foot giant and he called me on the phone. I said, all right, God damn it. Don't show him to anybody. Bring him to the office next Tuesday. And this one was seven foot six or whatever. And that's how we got poor Paulo Singh, the giant Singh. It, it was, he didn't work out as well as big show. Who's the giant Singh? Remember? Giant Silva? Giant Silva, Silva, not okay. Singh, Silva. Sorry. Paulo Silva is his name. <clears throat> he was driving a truck in New Jersey, legitimate giant Silva driving a truck in New Jersey, and he didn't speak English. So when he came to the office, he brought his neighbor. I forget what his neighbor's name was, but his little, <laughs> little woman that was his interpreter. 
and was as nice as could be, but that was the way you spoke to him at first. He was the, the giant that didn't get away, but Big Show did. Now Tony Khan's got him. Maybe he'll get Silva too. What do you think? Should we talk about this program? I don't know if we should, but we will. Well, if anybody's still interested at this point, this is the All Petite Wrestling Program for February the 24th. Um, I'm just wondering, now we, we've called them All Petite Wrestling, but now we got we to gotta do something with abduction in the A, because they actually came out and admitted it. Did you hear when <laughs> Jungle Boy in his stupor promo voice said, they abducted Marco. Like, and and then they crossed the street and got some gum and they abducted Marco. Abduct everyone wrestling. Abduct everyone wrestling. There you go. <laughs> Boom. Done. Okay, the latest episode of Abduct Everyone Wrestling for February 24th. Uh, the opening, of course, the CEO of Moxley Plumbing hiked in from Tallahassee. It's farther and farther every week. But he probably... He probably wanted to take most of the time uh, on his entrance instead of actually having a match that he should have. Is this the first time we've seen Moxley actually do what he should do with someone? And it's always Ryan Nimeth. Ryan Nimeth is the best talent that they have in AEW. He's a heel. He knows his role. He attracts attention to himself at the same time he puts his opponents over like crazy. If he could work like his brother, he ought to be their champion. But for effort, psychology, and doing his job, he's a 10 out of 10. And as a, this is the only match that I've ever seen Moxley have, I think, where he just went in and beat somebody and looked like a fucking top guy instead of going 18, 20 minutes out on the floor with everybody in the world. So, And, and of course, Ryan, I'm sure, uh, realizes that they're using him because he's making everybody look great, but at least one guy has the fucking gist of what he's supposed to be doing. Everybody else goes out there to have the main event at Starcade 86. And Moxley, he won with his DDT. Well, between him and Serena Deeb, there is an argument for these OE, OEW, these OVW alumni coming in and being professional. And Ryan wasn't even in OVW with the big class. He was years afterwards. But you get people that know what they're supposed to be fucking doing. If you get a guy to do a job, have him do a job, get a little steam so the guy can make a fucking comeback and get fucking beat and look like a fucking heel doing it. That's that's what he just did here. But then... That was to leave, actually, I thought he was just wanting to get the match over with quick, but it was to leave 20 minutes for his fucking promo. I've mentioned before that Moxley has an unimpressive-looking physique. That is exacerbated when he turns a chair around in the middle of the ring and sits backwards in it like a fucking drunk at the corner bar and slumps over the back of it where his shoulders looked even more pale and slumped over and his arms looked smaller. <laughs> and he does the, the promo where in his mind, he's this violent, he's the living incarnation of a cross between Bruiser Brody, Abdullah the Butcher, and a fucking cannibal. And he's trying to be this vicious person. But then he's talking about an exploding barbed wire death match. So this is on a show where everything is obviously fake and is all done for laughs. But he's coming out and acting like he's really going to fucking blow somebody up. And as it went on and on and on, my I finally got the feeling that his psychology seems to be, we all know this is bullshit, this program I'm on, but I'm going to tell you that even though it's fake, we're really going to hurt each other doing stupid fake shit. And it, the point of the promo was not, I'm, I'm mad at Kenny Olivier and I'm going to kick his ass. It was the promo point was, I'm going to give the fans everything and might actually kill myself and you'll get to see it while doing a performance with this fucking guy that we all know is bullshit. Was that what you got out of that or is it just me? I've been pretty complimentary about his promos and had a lot of issues with his matches. This was kind of the reverse this week. 
I thought the match was all right. <laughs> yeah. And the promo just didn't do anything for me. And look, this is where I'm a, I don't know what you want to call me, an old man. I mean, I'm 41, but this is where I'm an old man or I just don't get it. I hate the idea of a wrestler just being able to, after the match, just sit down and grab a mic and talk and do a speech for five minutes. I'd much prefer Dasha or someone out there holding a microphone and letting him talk instead of well, no it's community I have this theater it's not a it's not a yeah. sports program it's a fucking community theater and drama class where everybody gets to emote and perform i didn't really like this moxley promo and typically i've liked his promos there was something about this one that just didn't do it for me he's telling everybody i'm not fighting this guy because we're mad and we're gonna have a fight it's that me and this guy are gonna do a bunch of stupid shit for you people and possibly hurt ourselves and you'll get to see it and that's the same thing as the fucking, you know, guy that bites the head of the chicken off at the county fair. They don't do that anymore. That's another thing they don't do anymore. No, I think that's they don't okay, have a though. good circus sideshow geek biting the heads off chickens. I'm okay with that, but I will give Moxley some credit. I thought, even though I didn't like this promo very much, it was better than the Omega promo in terms of building up this match. <laughs> but we will talk about. Kenny Omega and his hammering of objects later on in the show. Oh, God. Yeah, he's used to beating on things. Uh, they did do, actually, after the Moxley interview, they did a video of the garbage matches they've had in the past where they went through furniture and glass and used barbed wire baseball bats and basically en encapsulated everything wrong with modern wrestling in 90 seconds. So there's that. That makes me want to see this exploding barbed wire death match all the more. Explain to me what came next. Lance Archer and Felix are in the locker room with, it wasn't, it wasn't Officer Bar Brady, it was the other guy. I can't remember his name. He speaks Spanish real well. And they're standing there. Jake is not there with Archer. It's from last week, they said. Last week after the matches, we caught up with so-and-so. Archer and Felix have been partners and on the same side. But now next week, or uh, this was the promo was last week talking about next week, which is tonight. They're standing there together, but they're going to wrestle each other to the winner to qualify for a multi-man ladder match. That's going to be on pay-per-view for some unknown reason. And Lance just says, well, he's going to kick Felix's ass. And then Felix says something in Spanish to the announcer that they laugh about, and Archer doesn't know what the fuck he said, so he asks the announcer, what did he say? And the announcer says, what was it he said? Something about, you're the worst partner he's ever had, and Archer immediately attacks him, and they broke into the fakest-looking, blasé backstage fight that I've ever seen. Where it's just, okay, it's time to do this now. Boom, 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 boom. Archer keeps almost getting over. <laughs> and then they do or air stupid shit like this, and he looks like a putz. They just went from zero to 30 instantly from standing there to, well, let's fight, and then the fight was the shits. And this is to promote the match they're going to have later on. Is that what I saw? Yeah, I don't know what that was. First of all, I'm not sure who the interviewer was, uh, but that's fine. That's the least of our problems here. I think it was Raul Gomez de Molina Jr. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. It wasn't El Gordo. But I gotta say, between the Kingston thing and now this, Archer's just been involved with stuff I don't give a shit about at all. And I'm not exactly sure. This wasn't good. Well, you can't keep track. Who the fuck? Babyface, heel, partner, friend, foe. I don't... And Jake wasn't here. And based on the way Jake's been looking the last few weeks, I'm pretty sure he wasn't doing DDP yoga either. Well, he's there later on at ringside. Oh, and he did so much. And he I, he actually did. Inter well, we'll get to that. Um, This was the part where then they get the footage from, from the, the loading dock where here come the middle-aged Bucks with their right-wing birther nut parents, Mama Buck and Papa Buck. Old man Buck is both balding and pie-faced, so at least we don't... I was going to say we, we might have uh, uh, suspected the milkman, but... 
they're religious, so that wouldn't happen. Now, you can tell old man Buck is responsible for both of these sperm dollops. You know, everyone knows that Steven Seagal is like a bit of a shady character, but the young Buck's father looks like young Steven Seagal, but skeevy. Cat, yes, with and with the ponytail, and he's like a 65-year-old right-wing hippie. It does. It just doesn't matter. The picture doesn't match. What a what a wardrobe the last two weeks that this oh, weirdo boy. has on this show. And he's a public figure, folks. He's on TV. He's about to get juice. Every time I see him, it explains so much about why the Bucks are the Bucks. Yeah, <laughs> it really does. <laughs> and he didn't get juice, but we'll get we'll get there. Well, yeah, we, yeah, we'll we'll get to that. But he wanted to. He got cats up. Um, he didn't get juice. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, so they walk into the loading dock and they stopped by the, the truck, the AEW ring truck that has the Bucks picture on it to take a picture with their parents and their, their picture on the truck. And it's just love is in the air. The next match, actually, I have to give this one, I think, match of the night. Uh, Varsity Blondes, Cajun Starks. They actually had a tag team match. They wrestled they worked um it, it made sense except for cage a little bit we'll get to that um pillman's looking great physically uh he and, looks and like he, his dad i've said it before yeah. but man every week it becomes more and more apparent but he's he's gained a little weight but he's filled out he looks good he's got more poise now i'll tell this now because it, it it's not embarrassing now because he's come a long way but two years ago next month, I think it was either in New York or in, I think it was New York. Yes. The, one of the MLW tapings. I gave him and the guy that he was working with a spot. I said, look, here, do this boom, boom, boom for your heat spot for a cutoff or whatever. And there was a stooge outside the ring with the heel. And it was going to be that he would duck a fucking clothesline, hit the ropes, duck a fucking something else, dive out, do the drop kick on the guy at ringside, jump back in and blah, blah, blah. He got lost and had to hit every single side of the ring ropes, <laughs> north, south, east, and west, to finally get lined up to where he could do that spot. To right, he just his positioning was blah. Here he was right on this stuff. He and Starks were doing some nice stuff. Then they did a beautiful drop down trip the way it's supposed to be where the guy drops down to trip the guy running at him. Starks took a rolling bump because he was tripped and went to the floor and Pillman hit the missile drop kick and the, the positioning and everybody was moving, grooving. He's, he's come along well. Um, which is another reason why I don't know why. Well, I think I do know why. He works the whole match. They get the heat on him. They give Garrison a comeback, then they tag Pillman back in again to get beat. I'm thinking that from what I've seen of old Griff here in this one, he's just gangly and awkward. And the less seen of him at this point, the better off he comes and let Pillman do the work. That's the only thing I can think of because Pillman is clearly the star of this team, but he's the one constantly getting beat. Anyway, uh, the heat spot was nice. Starks shoved Pillman off of a springboard to the floor and there's cage to power doing that buckle bomb into the post. But did you see what fucking idiot Mr. Get My Shit In did? Oh, that was brutal. I felt so bad for Brian Pillman Jr. He got thrown into the post and he landed just ass first awkwardly on the stairs. On the corner of the steel Ooh, ring step. Yeah, brutal. Because dipshit Mr. Get My Shit In he, it, obviously they called that spot. So obviously either they didn't walk through it to see where they were going to be at, or if there were going to be obstacles, or if they, if they did do that, then they were in the wrong place. Or I don't know who the producers and agents are on this thing, but all dipshit had to do was pick him up and take him and buckle bomb him into the other post. Instead, he buckle bombs him into the post right next to the steps and he lands on the corner of the fucking steps. Once again, Brian Pillman, a young man, happy to be there. A lot of guys would have got up and had an issue with Mr. Cage. Um. Anyway, and they go to the break there. They come back, they got the heat 
going on on Brian and and Brian here is a another free piece of advice when you're fighting from underneath and you're coming up off your knees swing those gut shots put some oomph into them make the heel cut you off don't just put up token resistance act like you're making your comeback if he don't fucking stop you he'll stop you he'll go to the eyes or he'll cut you off with a knee or whatever but the oomph there was no oomph, there was no force behind the the gut shots and the chop there was no body language fight you're fighting for your life don't get up on both feet and then swing them get up on one foot and a knee and come from the fucking bottom and it also makes it easier for him to cut you off that way starks is a good heel nice little gestures and body language and facials he's a prick the hot tag was abrupt pillman just ducked a chop and did a forward roll to it and i know they're trying to make a hot tag out of nowhere but god almighty that was just a little abrupt could you not take brian pillman back in the corner and go for a fucking chop and let him duck it there and fucking spin you around and chop you and go for a shoot off and you fucking reverse it and he goes up on the goddamn fucking turnbuckles and tries the cross body but you duck it he crashes and burns you pick him up and go for a goddamn suplex he drops behind goes into the neutral corner you rush him he goes between your legs then he rolls and hits the fuck. That's just me. <clears throat> anyway, uh, or there could have been a heel tag team double fuck up because here's the thing. If you notice, whenever these hot tags, as they call them now, are made, it's just simultaneous tags with the the baby face, the new baby face coming in, and the new heel coming in. If the heels are going for a double team maneuver, but the baby face you've gotten the heat on somehow evades it and causes them to crash or fuck up or whatever then the baby face can sell over to the neutral corner wait till both heels get up to their feet and then do the roll and the duck and dive and boom when he makes the hot tag both the heels are in the ring ready to feed for the comeback but anyway this was not any of those griff garrison made an okay comeback he's just a little gangly and green at this point uh, they did the nice drop kick off the top rope into the power bomb false finish, kind of like the old Southern boys fucking double team. And that was a nice, good, close false finish. And then Cage, they went for something else, another double team, and Cage foiled it, clotheslined everybody, and hit Pillman with his finish, one, two, three. And I've, the, the right team won. The heels are being pushed. The blondes are underneath baby faces right now, but. Once again, Pillman works the whole match. They get the heat on him, and then they beat him. And that used to be the way to bury a baby face on purpose. I assume they're not doing that. Maybe it's just because Garrison's just so green, but good God, split it up a little bit. What do you think? I thought this was pretty good. I'm not as negative on Garrison as you. I'm going to give him time. Obviously, he I'm works not. I'm not less. negative. It's just that he's another green rookie kid on a television show full of green rookies. In a green rookie tag team. Yeah. Although I think Brian Pillman Jr., the more I see of him, the more I think he has major star potential. I've said it before. I mean, I hate to just repeat myself. I wish there was a place he could work where he could work a full schedule and yeah. have ring time in front of a crowd all the time. Because I think he's charismatic. I think he's obviously very athletic. There are things he has to work on, like his drop kicks and just little things. But he's got a ton of potential. And eventually they have to get to a point where he's not doing a job on TV all the time. Really, I'm really impressed with Brian Pillman Jr. The more I see of him, and physically, look, there are periods of time where Brian Pillman Sr., I had never called him that before, <laughs> where Brian Pillman Sr. was clearly on some supplements and was really, really cut. But in terms of the same sort of physique off supplements, it's amazing yeah. how, how similar their physiques are. Amazing. Yeah, and and that's the thing is you can tell Brian's gained weight and he's filling out a little bit, but it's not ridiculous. That, you know, anyway. Okay. <sighs> explain God damn it. explain this to me brian we have a video of sting driving a truck in the desert dragging a body bag on a rope behind it that is filled with darby allen his partner 
which is the same thing that the heels did to Darby Allen last week that Sting was supposed to be so upset about and, and why they're mad. Help? And I know what they're doing. They're showing that, hey, look, Darby Allen doesn't mind being put in a body bag and drugged behind a fucking pickup truck at 60 miles an hour. Now, we can answer the question later about whether the majority of people seeing that says, well, you're a pretty dumb, stupid fuck for not caring, but he, at least he doesn't care. But if he doesn't care and he lets his friend and partner do it to him, then why were they mad when the heels did it to him? And if you can just do that all the time and suffer no ill effects whatsoever, then it's obviously a fucking trick and it's not goddamn dangerous anyway, except it really is dangerous, even if it is a trick, in which case you're a fucking idiot for doing it all the time. Is this what I was supposed to take away from that? I don't know what the takeaway is. <laughs> I really don't. I don't know what the takeaway is. <laughs> You know, so they there, there's oh, some people, ahead, ahead. there are some people who get off on pain. Remember, uh, Bill Murray and little shop of horrors. He enjoyed getting that root canal. Darby Allen, little did team Taz know while they were dragging him in his body bag, he's sitting in there jerking off. He loves it. Well, but here's the thing. There's, there's no goddamn finish to that bit, right? Okay. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you. But then sting didn't get in there and fucking whack him off. If it's the, if it's the buildup to a fucking spurt okay but he's, he's not getting any goddamn relief there they're just hurting him without the good stuff at the end when did team ties cut bait all right we've dragged him enough let him go apparently not long enough because he he wanted some more sting get in the car let's show them that i actually like this we'll get a camera crew and then i'll smile at the end so they show that video <laughs> and then it starts snowing <laughs> And Sting comes out dragging a body bag. And of course, the announcer, well, he's got Darby. He's got, that's because that's how Sting carries his friend Darby around in a body bag. But he unzips the bag and it's not Darby. It's Taz's son, Hook. Wouldn't you know who won the body bag? My son, Hook. Another kidnapping. Hook is in the body bag. Then when Taz realizes that it's his son in the body bag and here comes the heels, then Darby Allen comes into the ring on a zip line, which has suddenly appeared in this outdoor amphitheater, comes in on a zip line carrying a skateboard. And when he gets to the ring, the heels have to feed him for skateboard shots while he's still <laughs> attached to the goddamn zip line. He's tied up, hanging from this line, with a skateboard in his hand, you got a 275-pound jacked-up bodybuilder, Ricky Starks, and Taz, and all they can do is just run to him so he can hit him with working shots with the skateboard that look like shit because you can't work with a skateboard. And Sting comes into the ring while Darby's trying to get unhooked from this thing and throws five kicks at Cage, who never goes down. He just, and he just backs up with no body language whatsoever. It is the most boring, blase, and, and whether it's fake or just nothing-looking offense that Sting gives Cage every time they touch. I don't understand. It's almost like Cage is sandbagging him to make him not look effective. Sting hit five kicks on Cage during the sk shitty skateboard shots. Then Sting hit Cage with five strikes between chops and kicks, shot him into the buckle, hit him with a clothesline, then Cage took a bump, and then Sting hits, shoots him in again and hits a stinger splash and hits the scorpion death drop, and now Brian Cage is laid out cold and, emo and em motionless, unmoving. He went from not selling anything to selling like death from the scorpion death drop and then Darby Allen and Sting walked around while Cage laid there and the rest of the heels had run off. Did did I imagine it, or did they just pretty much get their complete revenge on the heels on free TV 10 days before the pay-per-view? Yes, remember Sting, who we were led to believe couldn't take any bumps or he could potentially be paralyzed, 
took a bump last week, and then they just moved on with the show. Now he came back and he made his big comeback. And kicked the heels' his ass. You know, if I was Cage or Starks or even Taz, when I got in that ring, you know what the first thing I would have said was? Hey, is that a zip line? <laughs> no one noticed a zip line? If I'd have been Taz, first thing I'd have said was maybe I can find a loophole in this contract where I can get the fuck out of here before they bury me completely. Hey, can I ask you a question? Um, and it's weird that I had this thought, but I did. You know, Sting famously used to drop down from the ceiling in WCW, and after the Owen Hart tragedy, I don't believe they ever did that again, and I don't believe anyone ever dropped in from a, you know... No. ...on a line again. And I hate to say, I thought about that when Darby did the zip line into the ring. Is that crazy? I mean, should I not be well, comparing not, the two things, or...? No, you, you actually, you shouldn't. In all fairness to AEW... Uh, the thing with Owen wasn't a zip line. And well, also, I and I recognize well, that too. But also, things, yeah. the, the very same reason why that it looked so stupid when Darby Allen was standing there tied up, hooked up to this thing, and the heels having to run to him and take bumps off of him is what they were trying to avoid with the thing with Owen, which is a quick release deal so that he could immediately come out of it. And that's what led to the issue. But ne how about neither of the above would work? It's fucking stupid. Owen shouldn't have been dropping from the ceiling. Darby Allen didn't need to and, and be instantly released to do his stupid shit. And Darby Allen didn't need to be zip lining from the fucking roof because then you're tied up to the thing and it looks stupid as fuck. So how about don't do either because it's stupid. And when did Snow become part of Sting's, the surfer, Sting? When did Snow because become he, he part of this whole thing? He debuted on Winter is Coming. <laughs> so in July, it's still going to be snowing. <sighs> <laughs> Will it snow during the street fight? That's the big question. I hope so. I really do. <laughs> I hope they're out there fighting in the snow. Uh, all right, anyway. Um, Tony Schiavone was, did a sit down with Miro and Pip and Penelope Pitstop. Pip speaks like Stewie Griffin's little brother. Have you noticed with the, with the accent and that he looks so, so pale and so pippy. Looks like he weighs 126 pounds. He, 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 Jesus Christ. Anyway, Penelope sat there mute. Miro did most of the speaking in his completely indistinguishable Eastern European accent. He offered Chuckle Fuck Taylor to come back and be his butler. He liked Chuck as a butler. Charles. Charles, the butler. <sighs> Tony Schiavone gets a note from Chuckle Fuck and whoever, I guess, his little dog pockets asking them if they want to wrestle a match. And it's like, yes, no, maybe, circle, whatever. It's a note. It's a waste of TV time. What the fuck? This is, I hope Tony Khan gave Miro a million dollars because I want him to feel especially anally raped when he realizes what he spent versus what he got with this fucking idiot. Is is is. is you could take a guy that's never been in the wrestling business before and say, go get over on TV better than Miro, and he'd figure it out. Live. Is it Miro's fault, or is it Tony Khan's fault? Both of them. Miro has a lot of ability. He's To do what? He is good in the ring. What? I thought he was good as Rusev. But okay, now he's here, Rusev. and he's doing these stupid promos. I, and see, I see a guy that thinks that the wrestling business is a joke. I see a guy presented on the same level as the underneath preliminary talent that he's teamed up with and he's wrestling against. I see a guy that doesn't know how to get himself over, doesn't know what he's doing, and has been a complete flop. But Rusev was good. Anyway, the next match was exceptional. Jake Hager versus Brandon Cutlett. We've mentioned Brandon Cutlett, of course, is a childhood friend of the middle-aged Bucks from 
Rancho Cucamonga. And so he gets a big entrance and gets a goofy outfit with face paint to wear. It's the biggest entrance ever for a winless job guy. But he's friends of the Republic Bucks. So he gets that. And I started to take notes on this. And I say, you know what? Nobody even wants to hear me make fun of this. Cutlet's rotten. His buddy's got him a job. Hager beat him up. And I just sat down and waited for the finish. Suddenly, Cutlet made a comeback and hit not one but two dives out of the ring in succession on poor Jake Hager. The second one almost killed both of them and or almost broke Hager's leg. I am, and they've made Hager completely meaningless because there's another guy that the big show could work with. But he's Hager with that monotone face and that goofy slope faced fucking demeanor that he's got. And he's just a big awkward putz and he's been booked into oblivion and he's been bumping for midgets for months. So people might buy him against big show for 30 seconds. Of course, yes, he is a real MMA fighter, but you would never know that by the way he's presented. And of course, you know, and it's not like he's Matt Riddle or anything, like he's the toughest guy on two feet. He's the baddest man in the world, Matt Riddle. So anyway, they, so they can't figure out a squash match. And finally, Hager beat him, but not without a lot more effort than it should have been. I didn't see anything else of it. That's every squash match, though. I mean, it's very rare. Kenny Omega beating Sonny Kiss, I could think of off the top of my head. It's very rare that someone who should lose quickly loses quickly in AEW. Ryan Nemeth. Ryan Nemeth, even that He's wasn't the only that one. quick. That wasn't well, as quick. Well, it, it, was, it, was, it was quick compared to normal. Anyway, after this, so Jake Hager has just beat a job guy, probably the lowest talent on the totem pole that we've never seen even win on television and barely seen on lose on television. So of course, Santana and Ortiz and Wardlow have to come in and start getting the heat on him after he's already got beat. And the only reason this is done is just to set up a save when you're obviously doing shit that has no place otherwise than just to set up what's going to happen next lazy booking so they got weak lackluster heat on him where nobody actually even looks like they know how to stomp or kick and they weren't following through with shit of course the bucks immediately come out and throw their shitty super kicks they can't just grab people and punch them or pull them off of somebody they have to do intricate ducks and dodges so they can throw their super kicks remind me if anybody's ever beaten my ass not to call the Bucks for help, well, I wouldn't do that anyway. I'd call somebody who could actually whip somebody. But I, I, especially if they were my friends, I'd want them to come and help rather than waiting for an opening for a super kick. But as soon as they do that, of course, the heels powder and then Pie Face gets the microphone and cuts a promo like he's a badass and challenges Jericho and MJF to come on out right now. So they play Jericho's music. And then you know what happens. The screen pops up. And on the screen, Jericho and MJF have kidnapped Papa Pieface. And he is on his knees, selling like he's in a trance. Like that someone has starched <laughs> his entire outfit of clothing and nothing will move except his head kind of back. And he's got fake blood obviously fake blood smeared all over his face and he's got some in his hands so when they throw him into the truck he can mark the right places for the dramatic picture they're wanting to get there was a lot in his hands a lot <laughs> in his hands yeah because he had to mark up two pictures on the truck and what the amateurs behind this fiasco were going for is that yes it would be a dramatic scene if vicious heels had somehow accosted the babyface's father and bloodied him up and fucking rammed him into the truck with the pictures of his sons on it. So his blood was all, Oh, that's great. Except it's the fourth fucking kidnapping in a week and a half. It's obviously fake blood. The guy's selling like a goddamn mannequin where it's suddenly being hurt and bloodied makes you immobile and frigid and stiff and freezing. 
and been leaning back like, you know, you're on the cross. And they've done some shit with this guy and his kids that are completely unbelievable that nobody gives a shit about on a personal basis because everybody knows this is phony and they just want to watch the trained chimpanzees do tricks. So it would have been good except for all of those reasons. So they run him, and when they run him into the truck, since he obviously can't work, he just he goes into the truck, and then he puts his hands up where the blood's supposed to be smeared and then slowly drops down the back of the truck. And the bucks run to save him, but they're jogging. Someone is literally beating your father bloody, and you're going to help him, and you're jogging? And they run in too late, and Tony Schiavone put the fucking perfect period on this sentence his quote was it's a horrible scene it sure was it was this it was a horrible scene when they did the same angle in segment two it's a horrible scene where was the mom we saw her come in with the dad at the start of the show she's been kidnapped (laughs) they kidnapped her too okay they're gonna be having their way with her somewhere over in a cabin somewhere in the woods out in out Alligator Alley there. Why was the uh, buck that tries to be the tough guy on the mic, why was he so mad challenging Jericho and MJF? Last week, they got punked by his dad. Last week, the dad pushed Jericho. Oh, well, they the bucks were mad because the, they had just been, the inner circle had just been beating up their childhood friend, Brandon Cutlet. But not Jericho and MJF? No, because they were in the back waiting to come up on screen so they could sodomize the... Buck's father. Look, the, the Buck's father was ridiculous in every way. His acting. Every way. The fake blood. It's the fakest blood I've ever seen in wrestling. Just just all over his face and his hands. I mean, it made no sense. And I got something to say that will make you, and I don't I didn't think this was possible, but this will make you like this whole deal, this whole segment, even less when I tell you what I'm about to tell you. Oh, okay. They made a point of letting people know. On the internet, I don't remember whether it was Shivani, I don't remember whether somebody, but whatever, in one of their their celebratory circle jerk sessions where they all get on the internet and talk about how great the performances were that they did, the Buck's father really wanted to blade and get juice, but they wouldn't let him. To show what kind of a, a tough guy and a trooper, that old withered senior citizen, right-wing religious nut, birther fanatic fucking ex-hippie, Papa Buck, he wanted to get juice the right way, but we wouldn't let him. Well, why didn't you? Maybe one thing on your fucking show wouldn't look as phony as a football bat, you two twinks. Give me a so break. What's the matter? You can't let your fucking dad get a little juice for the business? I despise fake blood. The only time that I've ever used fake blood in my life, myself, or in any of my fucking angles was when you need to bleed from the mouth and I didn't have a fucking syringe to draw my own blood or somebody else's and put it in a fucking rubber and put it in their mouth so they could bite down on it. Otherwise, if you don't, if you can't, it's like a low fat Twinkie. You can't eat the fat. Don't eat the Twinkie. If you're going to have blood and it can't be real blood, don't have blood. Fucking lunatics. That's what everybody used to say. Ah, the blood and wrestling's fake when it wasn't. Now it is. I am disgusted by that. Who was it? The famous story where someone said, I know it's all fake and I know the blood is fake. And the wrestler said, well, actually what we do is we take a razor blade and we Jerry Jarrett. I'll tell you the the (laughs) Wendy's on summer Avenue, Jerry Jarrett and Bill Dundee come in Friday night from Tupelo or whatever. And it's midnight and the guy's closing and he sees who they are. And he said, I'll let you guys eat while we're cleaning up. And they're eating. They're the only ones in the place. And the manager comes over and sits down. And this was 19 fucking 79, 80, 81, whatever. Says, you yeah, guys, you know, you, you guys can tell me that, uh, that blood, you know, when y'all bleed on TV and everything, so I watch the show all the time. And that's not real blood, is it? Jerry Jarrett looked at him. He said, actually, it is. What we do is we take a razor blade. We buy it 7-Eleven. We take a pair of scissors. We cut a piece of it off. It's nice and sharp. We tape it up. We either put it in our mouth or right down in our crotch. When we need it, we pull it out. We cut the shit out of ourselves with it. 
and then we stick it back in our mouth or our crotch. And the guy said, all right, if you didn't want to tell me, you could just fucking told me that. <laughs> Fuck it, never mind. He walked off. <laughs> anyway. You know, one other thing about this segment. I can't criticize, of all the things to criticize here, and there's so much because it was ridiculous, and we didn't even get to the ambulance yet. I was about to say, uh, that's the first time ever in the history of wrestling a 65-year-old right-wing hippie has been loaded into an ambulance. By the way, he goes into the ambulance. Who joins him? His son, Nick. The good brothers. And that's it. No wife. And the other buck stays there because why? 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 There was no more room. Why didn't he go instead of Gallows and Anderson? It made no they, sense. Oh, because they're trying to sucker the Bucks into believing in them, too. That they're their friends. And, and where's blah, 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 the mom? Blah. Is she on the zip line? Where's the mom? <laughs> she just vanished. I wanted to say, of all the things you can criticize, I don't think MJF or Jericho really did too much wrong here. It was, it's not their fault that this was so silly. They did okay as heels doing a promo after beating him up, except for the very end, where all of a sudden they were frightened. Oh, come on, let's go, let's run! At the last second. Yeah. That I hated. I hated that. The chicken shit runoff from those two. That was, uh, they hammed it up and I didn't like it, but what a- Well, a chicken shit runoff because look who was coming. Two chicken the shits. Ducks. Yeah, the chicken shits. Yeah. The heels were the chicken shits. They were running from the chicken shits. <laughs> All right. Well, the big package came up next. We gotta, we gotta keep this moving. This, this fucking show is, is taking forever. Uh, the biggest match ever in the history of our sport, Shaq and Jane Cargill against Cody and Cake. They did a video package. They had Shaquille O'Neal next to a wrestling ring where Jane Cargill was in the ring working out with some guy and Shaq never got in the ring. We have seen Shaquille O'Neal slap the mat with his hand. He did that well. He's supposedly been training and taking this seriously for months now, according to what they say, but we cannot get one piece of video of Shaquille O'Neal in a wrestling ring doing anything to anybody. Because they're going to surprise us on the third when he starts doing moonsaults and leapfrogs and <sighs> Tope Con Hilo or whatever the hell. Yeah. Tope O'Neal. You know what he That's... hasn't been doing in wrestling what? school? Practicing promos. Well, that's what I was going to say. Besides the, the letdown of not seeing anything of Shaq in action and only seeing Jane throw some guy around once or whatever the fuck, at least they weren't playing basketball this week. But the, the, we used to call them history packages. We're going to do a history package on this angle to build a pay-per-view match. There was no history. They st in the package, in the, they have the opportunity to edit this video and they still could not make the origination, instigation, and buildup of this match make any fucking sense. Shaquille O'Neal still sounds like he couldn't give a shit. He's, they still didn't show him do one thing in the ring. Jane Cargill still cannot speak English to save her life. She sounds like she's, she's just learned to read Braille, and she's feeling the words out as they come. And we don't know why this match is. All we know is that Cody's wife is a pregnant bitch that threw fucking water in Shaquille's face because Shaquille's not girlfriend, but friend stomped on Brandy's arm because why? We don't know because she came out and interrupted Cody's interview. And why? Because and why? Because she said that Cody said he's a giant killer and she knows a giant. Maybe there's just been so much action. I forget. When did Cody start calling himself the giant killer? I don't know. Was that a thing? I don't remember. Apparently, apparently Paul White better be on the lookout. <laughs> <laughs> Is Cody going to get into the ring with Jade? Is Jade only going to work with Red Velvet or will she work with Cody? Well, we all better hope that Jane works with Cody because that could be the only combination that'll be any good because Red Velvet and Jane ain't going to be any good. And Cody and Jane, well... I don't know how that could be any good, really. And Shaquille and whoever, I don't know what the fuck. I want more sh more Shaq promos. Because they're so bad. It's just, he doesn't get excited about anything. 
there's not he's he's like cruising on Lake Havasoma. He's like he's drugged. He's like, well, yo, Cody, hey, I'm yo, gonna Cody. wrestle you in Red Cupcake or whatever her name is. What? You sound like you're really into this, Shaq. I I just I I don't understand. I would. You know, in in all things being equal, if this was just if this was my promotion, or if these wrestlers were working in one of my promotions and they gave these performances, I would cancel the match and fire them, because this is horrible, and it's it, it's inexplicable, and nobody nobody even knows who to cheer for, nobody knows why this whole thing came about except. Cody came the closest to explaining why it came about when he came out and did the interview where he said, well, we were going to do this thing for publicity, but then Brandy got pregnant. That's basically what he said. So now we're going through with it anyway. We're just sticking another girl in here. Nobody understands this. We don't know why anybody would think that we're mad at each other. Booker of the year. All right. Um, you need to help me on this next one. Uh -oh. Because Isaiah Cassidy with Matt Hardy and for some reason Evans and Angelico uh, wrestled Adam Page. And I got as far as writing down Adam Page is great and Cassidy is horribly green and has horrible looking gear. And then I zoned out. I know they went through a break. I know it went way, way, way longer and took uh, Page a lot more than it should have to beat this guy. But I don't know any specifics. What did I miss? I don't know how many specifics I'm going to be able to give you. You missed Angelico coming out with his dance. I, well, uh, that was on purpose. Can't get enough of that. I don't know where Mark Quinn is. Has they, have they said anything about Mark Quinn? Not that I've heard. I have a problem. And that problem is I can't get into this Matt Hardy, Adam Page program. I think it's primarily because it's Matt Hardy, but also they have blown it with Adam Page. Adam Page and MJ, I mean, there are so many guys that they should really be doing more with right now. And instead, Jericho saw that MJF was hot and moved the ratings, so he latched himself on to MJF. Yeah. And Adam Page has been doing stupid thing after stupid thing since he lost the match to Omega because they're not ready to do Omega and Adam Page yet. What you missed was at the end, the Dark Order came out to save Adam Page after Matt Hardy and uh, whoever else was sent away from ringside by the referee. And I don't know. I kind of zoned out, too. I don't know why anyone would. Well, I know that Matt this. Hardy was mad about the whole thing because after Page and the Dork Order minions were celebrating in the ring, Hardy comes out with. Dark Order number five. Here's a here was a half a kidnapping. We only saw it for his he he grabbed him, but then he let him go. He, but I think it still counts as kidnapping or at least unlawful detainment. He he took the guy and prevented his free movement where he wanted to go and threw him off the stage. So he didn't kidnap him and keep him. He kidnapped him to throw him off the stage through a table. But there's two and a half kidnappings in this show at least. You raise an important question. Certainly, Sting kidnapped Hook. Yeah. Was the Buck's father kidnapped? Or was he just attacked and we didn't see the setup? I mean, was he walking back by the truck again? Maybe he wanted to go get a, yep. a glass of soda? Because I mean, the, heels, the heels said, we saw this goof walking around. Okay. So they, they took him. When you, when you, when you prevent someone's free movement and either take them somewhere they do not want to go or prevent them from going somewhere, leaving the place and going somewhere they do want to go. That is kidnapping. So I, so you, you got, yep. Yeah, there's a lot of kidnapping here. It was just a few weeks ago. We pointed out, wow, they've done another kidnapping. I think they've done this a few times since <laughs> the promotion started since that time they've done, I guess on average, at least two a week. Yeah. <laughs> <It's happening. laughs> oh my god. It's so, so next bad. it's so bad. Officer Bar Brady came into a workshop where uh, Harpo Fingerfuck and Don Callis and some stooges were making noise with hammers. I did have somebody email me and said I've worked with that type of equipment and these guys didn't look like they've worked a day in their life and they don't know how to use these things. I had two different people send me the exact same thing. Olivia was just hitting things with a hammer. 
they're building the gimmick, the exploding barbed wire death Moxley elimination chamber or whatever, right? And Callis talked for a minute, and that's probably uh, Tony Khan calling me now for advice. And then Harpo starts doing his promo. Could you hear it? You couldn't hear his promo because he was doing his breathy phone sex voice and you couldn't even understand what he was saying. And that was pretty much it. It was not, we're building a dome of steel in Atlanta. It wasn't that. Uh, Do you think for the fan that isn't an observer reader or a fan of 1990s FMW, do you think they should have license some footage from whoever owns the FMW catalog or something just to, if you're going to do this stupid match. Yeah. Show what it is. I mean, how's anyone well, at home who's not a hardcore fan supposed to know what this is? But here's the thing. <laughs> if they show what it is, then people are going to go, that's what it is. I mean, you have to be a real garbage wrestling death match connoisseur to want to watch one of these things because they fucking suck. It's just all about the special effects. There wasn't a lot of wrestling in the fucking Funkin' Onita. That would not be considered a classic match by any stretch of the imagination in the ring without all the special effects and the bullshit. Am I right? Is this up with no, Funkin' right. Race or Funkin' Flair or Funkin' Lawler or Funkin' anybody? Funkin' Wagnall. Funkin' Wagnall, Yeah. It's a gimmick match. It's like it's like a scaffold, except with even special effects that are even more prone to fucking go awry. You can't have a good one. So it's it's you know it, at least with the scaffold we didn't have to worry about barbed wire and exploding special effects and etc. Just don't trip. They uh, they updated us on the women's tournament. Thankfully, I couldn't have gone a week without knowing what was going on there. Why aren't the Japanese women using that nice apartment? They're in a garage, an empty garage on these matches. They've got a nice apartment. We've seen the the Japanese Joshi apartment house wrestling. They've got an apartment. They've got a curtain over a fucking door. Why don't they have the matches in the apartment instead of the garage here? Just a question I had. Nyla Rose versus Britt Baker. You know what that was? 17 minutes. No, was it? From start to finish, I looked at the at the uh the the time counter and from the time that I started fast forwarding till the time that I finished fast forwarding was 17 minutes. I invoked the tooth and nail rule and the AEW women's rule which is, I don't give a shit. I ain't watching any of this stuff. What did I miss? I think you actually missed a pretty good match. Well, it's too bad they put Britt Baker in the tooth and nail fucking thing so that I would never watch her again, isn't it? Don't blame her. Blame Booker of the Year. I blame everybody involved in that. Everybody involved in that should have been exiled to a desert island. I thought this was pretty good. Uh, Nyla Rose doesn't have Vicky Guerrero for some reason. I thought that was her manager. That was her manager. We haven't seen her since the wedding. I don't know if uh, she was shackled somewhere as well. Uh, it was really, I thought it was really, really good. I thought it was really good. I think it was maybe the best Britt Baker match we've seen on TV. In the Observer Awards, she won Most Improved, and I think, <laughs> I actually think she may deserve that. This was really good, I thought. And by the way, all those Observer Awards that I've won in the past are now completely meaningless because apparently any idiot can win them. I never knew that. The next thing was the package to explain the issue and preface the big match next week, the six-man tag between FTR and Tully and the Jurassic Express. This is where Jungle Boy uttered the monotonic phrase, they abducted Marco like it was just something that happens every fucking week. Then they let Dwarf Dong Sucker speak. These are the most unlikable baby faces ever in wrestling. The, I mean, but at, at, at least Dino didn't say anything. But when that fucking dwarf freak of nature opens his mouth, 
it's annoying to grown adults. I don't know about the AEW fans, but to grown adults, it's an annoying noise from an annoying face, from an annoying little amoeba. And it kills Jungle Boy to be sitting in the middle of that. Because now, not only that, but you got this little fucking freak doing your talking for you. And just, and the biggest selling point is Tully getting back in the ring. And at least they showed pictures of him wrestling before, even though they couldn't buy any tape. Even though they made it sound like he never wrestled again after 1989. Well, he, he did that. I could have sold him some footage from San Antonio in 82 if they'd have wanted some Tully footage. But anyway, the point is, the whole thing is that FTR came in, the best tag team in the world, to have this dream series with the Young Bucks. The booking was botched. The Young Bucks beat them. They beat them handily. They've never recovered. Then they've gotten into mid-card oblivion with Jungle Boy, a budding star as long as he doesn't speak, and his two sidekicks that keep him down and bury everything they get involved with. And now FTR and Tully Blanchard's return to wrestling is to get in the ring, and the fucking dwarf is going to be part of it. So now they're making Tully a joke, and FTR is pretty much finished. The best in-ring tag team in the world. I tried to start making a list of things that I like more than Dwarf Dong Sucker. I started out with a sunny blue sky and little puppy kisses from my beloved Harley Quinn. I like those more than Dwarf Dong Sucker. And then I wrote down another 7,432 things that I like more than Dwarf Dong Sucker. And when I finally got to the fecal flex smegma that crusts under your foreskin after you've sodomized a trailer park crack whore. I like that more than dwarf dong sucker. I finally said, I'm just going to stop writing because there's nothing in the world that I like less than dwarf dong sucker. Moving on. The wrap up on this journey through hysteria was the main event between Lance Archer and Felix, which is a qualifying match for the Face the Revolution ladder match that will take place at the Revolution pay-per-view, which will be a multi-man ladder match with Cody Rhodes, Scorpio Sky, wherever the fuck he's been, maybe he got kidnapped too, Felix's brother Penthouse, they're already in the ladder match somehow, but this is a qualify. Have we have we missed these qualifying matches? Why did they get automatically put in this match? And but Archer and Felix have to fight for it. What is the goddamn face the revolution ladder match? It's a goddamn five or six man ladder match for the TNT title that Darby Allen holds. Well, what the fuck? Most of the people in this are baby faces. Why do we want to see Cody or Scorpio Sky beating up Darby Allen? And to have a qualifying match out of nowhere for a ladder match that you've named and are having specifically because the title of the ladder match also reflects the title of the pay-per-view, even though there's no reason for these people to have a ladder match, there's no reason for all of these people to be in the same match, except they're going for the TNT title. It's mom's basement booking. It's a fucking guy who plays with his friends on the internet, booking matches saying, Hey, we could have six guys have a ladder match, four baby faces and two heels for the TV title. And we'll have a qualifying match to get into that match but we won't have all qualifying matches because we don't have enough time because I just thought of the idea. The fuck is going on here? They've put a hat, a coat, gloves, water moccasins, and a goddamn hazmat suit on a hat. This is so gimmicked up, I don't even know where to start. If there isn't a tournament or a battle royal happening, there's always a qualifying match to get into the tournament. Or it's just, there's always something. There's always a tournament happening at all times, it seems like. 
or some sort of qualifying match for something. To get into something. Why are they having that match? Well, because it looks good when you write it down on paper. Or a battle royal where you get a, a title shot over and over and over again. And over again. And here's another thing. I bet Tony Khan loves to write these matches down. I bet you that when he writes these matches down, he don't have the finish. He might have who wins, but he don't have the finish in his head. I never booked a match unless I knew the answer to at least one and usually two questions. One, who's going to win? Number two, how? Because that way I know where I'm going forward. I don't announce a match unless I know who's going to win it and approximately how they're going to win it. it there, there can be one foot put in front of another when the guys are sitting down in front of each other, but you know he's going to fuck the guy, or you know he's going to use a foreign object, and you know it's going to be a DQ, you know it's going to be interference, you know it's going to be something. This is just thrown out there. Anyway, the first thing I wrote, I said, unless there's a big angle at the end, I've got to watch 18 minutes of Felix. Fucking hell. And this took forever. He's good on comeback flurries, and he's good with his big moves, but a singles match for 20 minutes, Felix ain't got it. And as soon as I wrote that opening statement, I've got to watch this for 18 minutes, Felix missed a roundhouse kick by two feet. And then they went and did the exact same spot over immediately. And Lance Archer is going to kill me with these head palm shoot-offs. Everybody's doing this now. This would have been the first thing that you were told to get out of the ring, sit down and listen on your first day at wrestling school if you did it. You would immediately be pulled out of the fucking ring, you would be chastened, and you would be sat out until you got the fucking picture for a head palm shoot-off. Now they're doing them on national television. So he did a head palm shoot off on Felix. Felix hung himself up in the rope, spun back, missed the roundhouse kick by two feet. Archer cut him off, shot him off the same way in the other direction, and then they did it where he blocked the kick to begin with. He wasn't even going to hit the kick in the first place. My fucking God. Like I said, Archer starts to get over just on his size and because he's kind of got some physicality to him compared to the rest of this fucking roster. And then... They put him in positions where he's either got to stand there and let this guy do handstands and flips around him, or they've got to do the contrived, figured out ways for him to sell for a guy that's a foot shorter and a 75 or 100 pounds smaller, where he's obviously standing there for this fucking triple jump fucking horse shit that Felix is doing all over the place. This was, goddamn, it was ugly as a fucking football bat. Jake at least interfered. Felix is up on the top rope. Jake grabs his leg and Jake is immobile. And Jake must, must easily go 300 pounds now. And he just holds on to fucking Felix's leg. And then Felix falls off the top rope onto the stage and takes a bump. Jake immediately turns to look at Archer to see if he's okay. After Jake has just tripped this guy off the top rope and he's taking a bump on the stage. Felix sold it for nine seconds. I timed it. And then got up and dives over Jake off the stage onto Lance Archer, but missed Archer, fell right in front of him, and Archer had to bump anyway. And then they go to the break. They come back. They're on the floor right in front of the referee. The It was the corpse referee. Knox, the reanimated corpse. Actually, he w he got out on the floor with them so they wouldn't be lonely. No count. They're out there for minutes at a time. Archer is being a big man, which he should be, and Felix is being a little man, which he should be, but because they made them go 20 minutes and Felix is not a very good fucking worker mentally, Archer did everything he knew to Felix five times but didn't beat him. But he couldn't sell him so he's just plodding around for 20 minutes. But then every time that he will beat Felix up for a while, Felix will make a comeback, fresh as a daisy, and then get stopped again. And as you mentioned, Archer did the goddamn rope walk moonsault again and only got a two count. Please stop doing that in every match. And if you're going to do it, beat somebody with it first. 
In eight to ten minutes, this match could have worked. They could have got by with it. This thing was fucking 20 minutes long, and it was fucking rotten. And they're, they're, they're getting sloppier as they go to the finish. Did you see the part where Felix tried to evade Archer's charge into the buckle? Yeah. Archer charges the buckle. Well, first of all, they're doing the back and forth thing, but and Archer's charging him with the elbow. Finally, Archer charges in. Felix raises the foot, catches him with a foot to the face. Archer turns around and sells it. Felix gives him a little shove like you're supposed to go out and come in again. So he fucking, Archer comes in again, but Felix tries to evade out of the buckle, flipping past him and then doing something. But he, when he flipped his feet out in front of him, he, the feet caught on Archer and, and Archer went into the buckle and Felix just fell in the middle of the goddamn ring. And it's, uh, I've, paused it i had to watch it again stace is walking by again i said come here you got to watch this she said well first the the top rope walk that felix did where he walked the top rope and then kicked archer in the side of the head they replayed that from four different angles and she's like what the fuck he barely touched the guy why are they replaying it i said oh it doesn't matter if it looked fake because he walked the ropes so he that's more important than him actually touching the guy that he's kicking and then she sees him fall in the ring and was, what the, f who is this guy? I said, oh, that's one of the Lucha brothers. They're the top stars. And then they did the deal where Felix somehow does a backflip off the top rope, but Archer moves, but Felix lands, does a backward roll, comes up in front of Archer and gives him a cutter. And she said, well, what the fuck what, did they mean to do that? I said, yeah, that's what they were trying to do. And she said, fuck this and walked out on it again. And that was that. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. She asked, was that what they were trying to do? I said, yes. And then they did the Spanish fly off the top spot where a six foot, six inch, 275 pound man has to get up on the top rope with this fucking little small guy next to him, and they've got to act like they're still struggling while both trying to stay on the top rope together so that they can do, they can obviously cooperate with each other in doing a backflip off the top for a Spanish fly. Cover, one, two, that's when kick out. They said, that's not the finish? Fuck this, and she walked out then. And Archer continued hitting the guy with everything and finally just got a finish on him that was flatter than a plate full of piss. He picks him up off the top rope, gives him his blackout razor's edge deal and pins him one, two, three. What the, f after all that, I don't know which one the baby face is. I assume it's the one without the interfering manager, in which case he just beat Felix, the baby face, flat with a fucking move with no out, no rebuttal, just beat him with a finish. Which, if he's supposed to be a top baby face, that's not something you should be doing. But secondly, what the 20 fucking minutes of this for? Is anybody going to pay to see fucking Felix versus Big Show? They might have paid to see Lance Archer versus Big Show if it didn't take him 20 minutes to beat a fucking midget. I... <sighs> and by the way, once again, the Spanish fly, that was impressive as fuck, but it wasn't the finish. And Felix gave it... You couldn't really tell who was given, who was receiving, but Felix gave it to Archer. So Felix hits that move. It's not the finish. And then seconds later, Archer just takes the baby face and picks him up out of nowhere. There's no fucking cheating. There's no goddamn out for the baby face. He just drops him with a finish. One, two, three. He could have done that 10 minutes previously if that's all they were going for. How rotten was this in your own words? Eh, it was... I mean, Phoenix is impressive with all of his flying around. I feel like the more I've seen of Archer, the more I've seen everything that Archer can do over and over and over again. That's because he has to do it five times a piece before he can beat anybody with it. I was just surprised this was like the last match. Like, this was the main event, technically, of the show. 
I don't know. It didn't do it for me. It didn't little, do it for me. But then little, again, I don't vote for the Observer Year End Award. So what do I? Little little pitchy for me too, dog. <laughs> All right. So coming up, our programming. Um, next week. The, well, this coming up, uh, we're the next drive through will be perpetrated on Tuesday as normal. Correct. It'll come out on Tuesday. I believe so. And then the next week's experience will be, uh, uh, we will talk about uh, whatever we talk about as normal. And then the following drive through, that's where we will, for lack of a better term, uh, review and discuss the big pay per view, which will not have Shaq because he's free, right? That's that following week. So, right. Not this. Not this coming week's drive through, but the following week we'll talk about this pay per view and see what happened. If Tully Blanchard takes a bump, by the way, for Dwarf Dong Sucker, you're going to see me hitting the ring. I'm not sure who I'd, I think I'm going to have to hit everybody. I'd hit Dwarf Dong Sucker and I'd hit Tully for taking a bump for him. Uh, but anyway, so uh, uh, our programming schedule will be normal over the next few weeks, but we're not going to miss the AEW pay per view and we also won't miss the big. Mixed tag team match. Uh, both of those shows are going to be live. So Olivier and Moxley has a chance to be just rotten. And then three days later, the mixed tag has a chance to exceed that. I can't wait. And don't forget March 7th for cameos and March 14th for the reopening of Cornette's collectible store at jimcornette.com. We got a busy couple of weeks coming up. I'm glad I've had a rest. Well, let's get another one right now. Arrest? Yes, please. Arre let's get arrested right now? All Not right. arrested. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Hold on. I want to do more for the show, but somebody's coming in my... Somebody's coming in the room. Somebody's grabbing me. They're, they're taking me... Oh, no. Are you being taking kidnapped? taking me away. Jim, are you being kidnapped right here on the show? Oh, no. Oh, my God, no. I can't. I can't get back. They're you have to sign me. off. You have to sign Thank off. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye. <laughs>